people. And he's taking me under his wing. And, you know, here you have a place to live out of kindness. And when you get old enough, you'll leave the nest. Instead of leaving at home, you leave here. Well, we went, I remember going to Washington, D.C., and I don't know if it was a center, somebody important, they had a Citron Maserati, because I remember it raised up on, on, on itself, and we drove around, he had a house in DuPont Circle, and we went there, there were four other, five other boys, eight, 10, 12, I was the oldest at 14, and he had two king-size beds pushed together with custom sheets. All right, everybody, it's playtime, let's get undressed, ha, 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 and have fun, and this was one of many that happened in different places and different different places. Someone was detected. Uh, shut up. Let me see if I can shut her up. Uh, um, we have to appreciate that Man Parish is so transparent with us on True House. The, the re- so, so I cut a lot of this out of my head, right? So, well, wait, can I just intervene for a second? And and people have to understand this is the early seventies. This yep. very she she yep. very kept quiet. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yes. If you had a gay uncle, if you had oh, a crazy mother. Oh, nobody knew about it. Nobody knew about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, your special needs, which we used to call retarded in those days. Yeah, right. That was all <laughs> hidden from sight because it was all about image and look. And I was gone away from home living in Manhattan, right? And I was a 14-year-old that had to live amongst 30-year-olds, right? So I put this all out of my head. And then... About four, three years ago, four years ago, I started, I always had a reoccurring dream of this guy down a dark hall, like a, it's a hallway in a parent's house and everything's dark. And there's a guy standing there and I know it's threatening. He comes towards me and I scream and I wake up. And this happened for 30, I'm 64. <laughs> I survived this. But this happened for 50, you know, 40 years, whatever it is. And then later on with therapy, I realized what that was. But I was telling this to a friend of mine online, this girl Manoush from Germany, and she said, it sounds like you were sexually abused. I said, I wasn't sexual. What are you talking about? And she says, well, I was, and these are my dreams. And that night I started remembering stuff because I had buried it so deep. And it wasn't, I don't, I wasn't ashamed. I mean, I I wasn't ashamed, but I was really hurt and I was really screwed up uh, uh, because of it. Uh, And I'll tell you that in a second. But um, that, uh, two or three days later, I got a letter in the mail from this place where this organization that the doctor was associated with saying, this doctor examined you and you may have been inappropriately examined. If you feel like calling us, we'll talk to you. You probably want a lawyer. And I called and I said, I want a lawyer. And they were very kind and very helpful and settled me out and all that kind of stuff. But later on, this guy who was married with a kid used to take poor, unfortunate kids to the country to have green, fresh air, the wife would go out for groceries and he'd climb in the shower and take him in the woods and do things to him. And this went on for a long time. So it was pretty rough, (laughs) to say the least. 14, 15, 16 years old. And then I lived on my own uh, in a loft uh, with a local guy, Joey Arias, and we had bands. And one of my roommates killed himself in front of me and I'm holding him as he's dying. And then came AIDS, and I'm holding friends as they're dying. And my therapist said, you have to realize you've been through a lot, but the fact that you're not in a straitjacket or you're not in a mental institution or a junkie shows that you have a lot of strength to you, and you should use that as a good thing, not a bad thing, which I do. And I tell my stories now because I want people – there's no value judgment whether you had 10 bad things or one small thing happen to you. But if you did, you're not alone. There are other people. So I, I, in England, I had a group called Man to Man. We had a song called Male Stripper, which I hated, right? It was dumb. Uh, uh, da, 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 I was a male stripper. Go, go, bar. Blah, 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 blah. Novelty song. So I was with, I managed village people, and we were in some small town, Sheffield, I think it was. And afterwards, this kid comes back, and I said, well, with village people in the wait a little bit, they'll come out and you do autographs. She goes, no, 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 you're a man parish. And I said, yeah, yeah. Your song, Male Stripper, saved my life. I said, what, what, what are you talking about? He said, and it's funny because they, uh, what is it? Little Britain has this little character, that's his character, I'm the only gay in the village. Well, he was the only gay kid in the village and he didn't, it wasn't out then, I guess. And he literally said, I'm in my room. I had alcohol, I had sleeping pills and something else, and I was ready to take them, and I turned on the radio, and Mel Stripper came on. That was going to be music as I'm dying. 
And he said, male stripper came on and I just figured out you're a bunch of faggots. <laughs> and he realized that he wasn't alone in this world. And I got goosebumps talking about it right now. And oh, Jesus Christ. And I gave him a hug and he said, I just want to thank you for saving my life and turned around and walked away. I stood there and I just started crying. And I walked into the dressing room of the village people. I was in tears like, oh, honey, what's wrong? And I said, you're not going to believe what just uh, happened to me. So sharing these stories are really important because a lot of people have pain. And now it's easier to get mental health. But a lot of. Oh, back then? I know a guy who's 64 years old, married with three kids. And then. It, you know, the kids moved on, the wife passed away, and he came out of the closet. He's been living as a gay guy for all those years. Like, what ah, I about I that. Know, have like, you like, ever, have you ever been compelled to feel like that you tried dating uh, a woman at all? And oh, then, no, no, I, I, I've had sex with women. And you know what's really weird is, e even though I'm in the gay business, I consider myself queer, which is different than gay, because that's why they have the rainbow of all the different colors, because it's like 50 shades of gray. I call it 50 shades of gay. Some people are 10% gay, 90%. You know, the straightest guy is looking at that, you know, the penis going, wow, that's pretty nice. You know what I mean? So I, there's no left or right, black or white. There's a gay or gray area in between. And I don't identify with heart. I mean, all my friends are gay. I've done gay parties. I, you know, I, work gay I consider myself queer. I watch straight porn. You know, what gay guy watches straight porn? So I don't right. fantasize about being straight, but I, yeah. I jokingly tell my friend, I'm closet straight. You know what I mean? It's like, it's weird. Yeah, I, I don't have, a lot of gay people had issues back in the 70s and 80s. That's why there were gay bars, gay restaurants, gay cruises, gay, gay tours. Because if they went with their boyfriend and they were effeminate, they would get beat up, literally beat up. I remember going to gay bars at 14, 15 years old, walking out, and the cops would hit you in the crotch with the nightstick going, what's up, faggot? You know, what, what are you, kissing boys in there? If I ever see you again, get out of here. I don't want to ever see you. <clears throat> and that was common, and you couldn't do anything about it. Now, on the other side, this whole thing that's going on now with don't say gay, which it doesn't say gay, it makes anger, stop it. I think it's hurting people that are trying to come out because now they're confused whether it's okay to be gay or not. This whole don't say gay thing is hurting people in the LGBTQ, XYZ, you know, you and me, and I'm happy to be community. You know what I mean? So I'm in the queer area, which is I'm gay, but I worked, I, I worked at Hellfire, which is a straight sex club. I was a bouncer. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? I've, I've dated women, had sex with them. And if it happened again, it happened again. But I'm more, I'm more queer, which is like weird. I'm gay weird. You know, all right. Well, well, well hey, listen. If there well, was, wait, wait, if wait, there was a good piece coming by, I would definitely you say, do. Oh, right, you know? like this to do what you do musically and all that. You must be eccentric. So let's put that all in the eccentric part. Well, I, well, that comes out of the damage and trauma that I had as a child, right? So I'm overexpressed myself. I over talk. I over emote because for so long I suppressed, suppressed, suppressed. I wasn't one of those artists that walked around and said, I'm man parish, kiss my ass. I didn't go to those parties because I was so damaged. I was a piece of shit. My mother used to tell me when people die, it's my fault when I was eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old. So you kind of grow up. I had more issues than Rita's digest. <laughs> you grow up with a few issues. So you were, were socially broken. I was socially broken. And who did I hang around with? Musicians, junkies, drag queens, other broken mental people. So my foundation of who I am came from a thing with no boundaries and no limits. So you become ex what many people call eccentric. I used to say is free. Now I realized was from damage. But would I do it again? Probably because I love who I am right now, you know. If you're not paying my rent, <laughs> you know, that's the way I feel. About well, no, but that's the thing, you know, what yeah. doesn't, what does they say? What doesn't hurt you doesn't kill you, you know, it makes you stronger. Uh, well, it's a tough road. You better, you, you better have balls to take it because it's not easy. I mean, I would come out of clubs at seven o'clock in the morning, people were going to work. And one part of me was like, Oh, look at all those bridge and tunnel people. They have to go to work. 
and then I'd go back to a loft with no hot water and no food and bar- borrow five dollars from somebody so I can get peanut butter and Campbell's soup. And my ca- my coffee table was like a um, you know a milk box crate with a piece of wood, and my mattress was something I found in the street. You know what I mean? So I was free, but I was outside of the world. My therapist said, what do you want to gain out of therapy the first day I went there? And I said, I want to come out of the darkness into the sunshine and to kind of just be like anybody. I want to, I want to just be me without, oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. But that happened because of what I went through. But it also gave me balls and no boundaries. You know, uh, Boy George is calling. Oh, yeah, I can take, care, take on that. You know, uh, will you come in and do keyboards on Glory Again as I am what I am? Sure. Because if I thought about it, I can't do that. I can't play keyboards. I can't get away with it. But I did it. So I am what I am. That record. There's there's pluses and minuses to that. If I don't know if I was, I only had a ninth grade, uh, four four months into ninth grade education. But then I then I um I taught myself. You know, I, I I thought everybody's got an education, and I'm dumb as dirt i better get my shit together and figure this out and i and i would teach myself stuff it's a, science uh, math is terrible things that would interest me i i would get scientific american think that i'm reading it and understanding physics i'm like i don't know what's going on but i was doing anything i could to expand my mind and in those days before the internet you had to go to a library and i'd go to libraries in manhattan that had music libraries so you put a record on and a pair of old headphones and i discovered music like I was doing, which was um, John Cage, uh, 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 um, Gershon King, who did Popcorn and edited that Popcorn song was tape edits and tones that he made. And I realized, wait a minute, I could do music like they're doing, but I don't have to understand music. So we're coming full circle now to your question that you asked me, you know, but I, 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 I didn't learn music musically i learned it through self-education and listening which helped me as a producer so being eccentric may have been good but i'll tell you something else and everybody can hear this the madonnas of the world that stand on stage in their underwear with their breasts or their balls hanging out in front of a crowd of a hundred thousand people going we love you and they go thank you and then they walk off stage and they don't feel love Thank God I never had it that bad, right? Because that's really broken. I remember I have tons of Madonna stories because she was my opening act and we used to see her at the Funhouse with Jelly Bean Benitez and all that kind of. We used to call her the skank because she had black hair and hairy armpits and a T-shirt that said I'm Madonna. Uh, those were the Arthur Baker days. And um, when you're that broken, it's bad. You have to get on stage and have people say I love you or, oh, that's Prince, that's Madonna, that's Michael. Those are broken, broken people. And they do great music and they're working out their issues through it. They, they've been studies that when you don't, when, 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 you, when, you, when you stop creating, well, no, when you have crazy people in institutions and you give them art or music, they get better. So music itself may be a way of dealing with issues in your life. Ooh, we're getting deep. <laughs> but, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, but see, this is therapeutic, and you know what? You never know who you're touching through this. Yeah. You no, know, I always say that. Um, we've all done, I mean, I've been interviewed countless times like you as well, um, and you talk about certain situations. Later on, you find out that touched somebody or changed their lives. And the thing that you hated the most or embarrassed of the most. Right, that helped them get the through it. Hip Hop was not a record that I was proud of because... Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Tell everybody that again. You were what? Hip Hop Bebop was not a record I was proud of until 20 years later. When, when I was doing these soundscapes, I started doing soundscapes with some beats behind it, okay? Just to figure out how to make music. How do I do beats? How do I make music? So... I got my first record deal through a porn movie. A friend of mine was working for a gay titty magazine, but for guys. So you were looking at the pieces, not the... And it was like Inches Magazine or something vile, right? And he said, I'm the editor. He said, uh, he was the editor. He said, there's this guy who's doing a porn movie and needs music for it. You'd be perfect. I went, okay. 
He says, give him a call. Now I'm an 18 year old boy and I'm thinking, I get to watch porn and make music. This is great. You know, a young boy's dream. Well, I called him. He said, I need a 10 minute piece of music, a four minute piece of music, piece of music a seven minute piece of music. And I'm sorry. My, my thing just took over. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I promise I'm back. There we go. Sorry about that, Mike. We don't want to lose Matt Parrish. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's I have ring cameras around the house, and it tried to show me someone was walking up the driveway. It was a mailman. Um, and uh, so um, I said, I don't get to see the movie. He goes, No, you don't. I just need the music. I'm like, Okay, all right. You know, so I give him the music, and he goes, I'll pay you a thousand dollars. And I went, A whole thousand dollars. Wow, I'm going to be rich because. I was doing records for 25, 50 bucks back in those days. I would be able to eat for a month or two or three or whatever it was. So um, I do the music, it comes out, and a DJ takes the porn soundtrack with all the moaning and groaning off of a Betamax tape and makes an acetated sunshine sound in Times Square where you can get a test pressing on, on, on acetate for $10, $12. And some, a friend of mine goes, you should go to the Anvil down the block from where you are on the corner of 14th and 9th, a triangle building with the Hooker Hotel above it. Um, they're playing your song. I said, what's the Anvil? And I don't have a record. He goes, trust me, you got to go there. You got to go there. Next day I go. I walk in. It opens up midnight. He goes, don't go before 3 in the morning or something like that. I go at 3 o'clock in the morning. On stage is a bald, fired, breathing drag queen. And a guy putting dildos in his butt, shooting them out over the audience's heads, and everybody's applauding. And I thought, oh, my God, I love this place. It's insane. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I remember standing against the back wall, like, you know, this is crazy, and I'm loving it. And my song comes on, and I crawl up to the DJ booth, and he goes, no, 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 no request. I said, no, 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 no. He goes, no request. I said, dude, that's my record. Well, what do you mean that's your record? No request. I said, I made that song. He goes, what's your name? I said, man, no, man Parrish. And he knew from the, from the credit of the porn movie. And he said, there's a record company called DiscoNet, which used to edit disco records. A lot of you DJs out there are going to remember this. And they want to put this out on DiscoNet. And that was by a guy, Mike Wilkinson, who worked as a advertising um, executive. He was an executive for an advertising agency. He's one of the three partners. And he cleared out a broom closet. And he would edit stuff at home would raise her and then put them all in envelopes in the broom closet and mail them out. And Raul Rodriguez was the mail boy working at the office that would help him out after hours. Right. Man, so, question. Uh, so question. next day he takes me. Wait, 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 wait. Question. Question. Who do you remember who the DJ was at the anvil? That yeah, you yeah, yeah. It was Lance Weiss. Okay. Lance Weiss was okay. the DJ. Next day you take me up there and we walk to an advertising agency and we go around the corner. We walk into this, Room closet, <laughs> this long rectangle blue closet with fluorescent lights, a copy copy machine, a desk, and a bunch of you know records scattered. Hey, Manny, it's Captain Mike. Uh, you know we want to put your record out. Opens the drawer, gives me a one page contract, and says, "Here, sign this." And I said, "What's that?" He goes, "It's a record contract, buddy. You're going to have a record out." And I went. Shouldn't I take this to a lawyer? He goes, oh, you can't afford a lawyer. He goes, would I screw you? And I'm thinking, yeah, you probably screw me, but I'll get a record out. Who cares? You know what I mean? Side it. Of course, it was firstborn, grandmother's furniture, the whole nine yards. It does really well on Disconnect. And he goes, hey, man, it's Captain Mike. I'm going to send Raul down. He DJs at New York, New York, a big disco. I didn't know what that was. And he's going to come and listen to some of your homemade tapes, and we're going to figure out what's going on because we could do that album that you see right there, that yellow album, that one, that nightmare, which we'll talk about. That cover, I had a stroke. <laughs> so, uh, so um, we, we went through a whole bunch of songs, and I, I remember one of them was was the beginnings of hip hop bebop. And he said, "Let's take this song." I said, "Raul, there's there's no structure to this. There's no." bridge there's no verse there's no chorus he goes i'm going to take you to a place tonight called the fun house and the guy jelly bean benitez is spending and i just want you to get a feel for for what's going on we go to the fun house we go into the the uh, dj booth which is the size of like a large living room and it had you know like a couches and arthur baker's hanging out and there's a girl like i said black hair and a t-shirt that said i'm madonna we all those and, and 
John Benitez is spinning, DJing, and he puts on a record, and all of a sudden we hear, and I went, oh, my God, what, what, fire? What's going on? What's going on? He goes, that's what happens when everybody likes a record. They bark at, at, the, at the DJ or, you know, the record. I said, why don't we take that hip hop, what was hip, before hip hop, why don't we take that and bark on it, and it'll be our little joke. We'll bark at them, they'll back, bark at us, case closed. Yeah, we'll get a little cheap thrill. We decide to do that as one of the cuts. They played it at the fun house and the place exploded. And other DJs that were there played it and it's exploding, not on radio, but through all these DJ things. And then, uh, uh, hey, man, it's Captain Mike. We're going to put out Hip Hop Bebop as a single. I said, no, 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 no. You can't do that. I want to be a racer. I want to be a, a, a human league. You know, I want to be, you know, uh, Depeche Mode. You know, this style of music was really new. There was only Planet Rock, so it wasn't a big deal like it became later on. I said, no, 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 you're going to embarrass me. I, I'm not a musician. You can't do this. And Don't worry. We got you. Mike Wilkinson would take bags of Coke and MDA and stuff it into that yellow record cover and send it out to every billboard reporter and every radio station with the one you're holding up. There were a little bit, see if there's Coke in there. <laughs> there may be a bag of Coke in there. And send it to every radio station, every billboard reporter with a note that said, we took care of you, now you take care of us. <laughs> it's like a mafia threat. And the record blew up. It blew up so much that um, the RIAA and the FBI had to come in because there are some guys downtown Brooklyn bootlegging it. That's You don't bootleg a record that doesn't sell well. I sold 5 million copies, which is a massive amount. And then an, uh, 80, 80 million to Grand Theft Auto, which is now considered sales. So there's 85 million record sales there, you know what I mean, over the years. And the story of Hip Hop Bebop continues because I didn't get paid. So I walked away from the record company. And then... Mike Wilkerson kept calling, whoa, oh, come on, Manny. You know, I'm the golden goose, right? He went from that little tiny office to opening up a big office with like 12 people and, you know, like a, or five or six people or whatever. He now had a real office, you know what I mean, going off the money made off of this. And by the way, Curtis Sabina, if you're listening, you were amazing at promoting that record. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Curtis. Thank you, Curtis. I hope Curtis Sabina's here. He's saying, uh, yeah, thank you, Curtis. You, 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 you were truly instrumental and in, let me you, let me just tell everybody hello because I, I haven't stopped you once his name is quarkman167 send him a special hello and thank curtis i love we all love curtis he's a great guy curtis is awesome and is still going producing stuff um you know when that shooting thing happened up in connecticut uh you know it, it, it happened to him and his family and all that kind of stuff and that's first school thing and curtis is a man of steel and he's uh unbroken and keeps going and if you're on social media follow curtis sabino he puts up these great mixes from great teachers i listen yes, to a lot of them stone is awesome teachers. yes so mike wilkinson calls me and goes come on manny you know we want you back uh, we'll work something out finally raul calls me come on bro let's go for a ride so mike wilkinson picks me up in this course with a hand carved dashboard and i figured oh, i'm gonna go down the block and go to the diner you know what i mean drives us to new jersey Pulls up to a plane, and I'm like, what's this? He goes, well, what do you think I'm Captain Mike? I got a pilot's license. So we get in the plane. We fly to Martha's Vineyard. Come on, Manny. We really need you. We love you. I'm sorry. You'll get paid. And I'm like, when? Well, you know, it takes a year or two or three to get paid by the time we do the accounting. Same BS as before. We get back in the plane. I said, you know, Mike, that Porsche is really nice. So this plane is really nice. He goes, oh. <laughs> do a few more records and you'll buy me another one. Literally said that to me. Literally said that to me. And I thought, holy fuck. I was on welfare. That's when they used to have the book stamps when you pull the thing. I was on welfare in Brooklyn living at my parents' house because I couldn't pay for my loft in Manhattan. That I, I wound up with David Bowie's manager. It gets, it gets just like an onion, right? <laughs> but I remember sitting in Bensonhurst and what we used to call the Dadalax, which are the your father's Cadillac, but the son took it out the evening on his date. The Dadalacs would pass, and Hip Hop Bebop, the Boogie Down Bronx, and one of the records would play. And I wasn't getting a penny off of it. And he was making a lot of money. So I walked away from it. Uh, a year later, he wound up getting AIDS, and the record company called me and said, Michael's in, uh, in, in Dallas, and he won't listen to anybody. 
He wants, he, he, he keeps saying, send Manny, please go there. He's walking around, the, the police have him, but he was walking around the streets in a hospital gown, no shoes, handing out $1,000, to $100 bills to people. And I thought, this guy screwed me. But then I thought, I'm a human being. I can't let a human being suffer like this. And this is my, because I've been through so much pain myself. They put me on a plane. I went there. I got him. I, I, I flew him back. And I said, that's it. You know, and he wound up, you know, passing away and stuff like that. He passes away. Uh, and um, uh, Stephen Van Blau, who was one of the office assistants, and Mark Siles took over the company. They put the key in the next day. And they were both co -cours. How do I know? Because Mark Siles became my friend and told me the story. He goes, you're a man parish. I said, yeah. He goes, I have a story to tell you, and you're not going to like it. He said, we sold your... Um, your masters to Unidisc in Canada for a thousand dollars. I said, "How could you sell my masters? They're mine." George you know, they, you mean George Cook Gazelia? George, fuck your mother. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, the same problem B Train has with his stuff. Oh, dude, dude, you don't you, you 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 don't know this dude Unidisc in Canada. So um, he said we went on we sold it for a thousand dollars on a Friday. Night, we did Coke Friday night, Saturday night, we were home Sunday, and he had the masters. I said, How did you do that? You can't just do it. He goes, We forged your signature on, 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 on a thing that says that you gave us rights. I had a minor heart attack and a stroke. And I thought, I don't have money to go to a lawyer. I had maybe $100 in my bank account, struggling month to month. Uh, and those records that I did for you know, emergency records, and, and, and Fred Maneo had select records, and on, on and on and on. We're doing for 50 bucks, 100 bucks. That's why we did COD in the bottle. What do we call this group? COD. We're going to hand you the record. COD, give me the cash because you never got royalties, right? You know, all that's a that was a thing. That was emergency records, right? COD. Emergency records, yeah. I, I, I can't remember. Eddie, Eddie O'Loughlin. Eddie O'Loughlin. Eddie O'Loughlin. Uh, 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 two sisters. Uh, we'd hang out and Stephen Van Blom in the office. You and Raul are like two sisters. You hang out. I said, let's do. Let's do two the other one the IRT record. Watch IRT is watch the closing doors. So what are you going to call? You go. Well, I got to take right? the IRT to come down from 96th Street to the to the studio on 23rd Street. Okay, we'll call it IRT. We all thought right. those were cool names. Like we're looking at it from a DJ, young kids going, "Wow, this is great." And Look if you were a DJ and you still have those records, we would take it to Frankfurt Wayne Studios, and Herbie Pumped Powers would engrave the center of it with his logo. I said, Herbie, can you put words on that? And and he goes, sure. And I put, let's put 12 black inches on a hole. And, you, you, you know, uh, uh, Hama to Mama, which I mean something vile in Spanish. I'm going to eat your mother or whatever. So we've inscribed, not all, but a lot of those records have these little hidden, you know, go F yourself, you know, kind of little things in there. So Grand Theft Auto 1 came out. And I had a party at the cock in New York. And what do you call a party at the cock on Sunday night to get people to come? But sperm. But it wasn't meant to be sperm literally. It was supposed to be sperm as a, as a seed. It's a new beginning. And we're going to do an art, an art fag party. And we decorated. We had live artists. And we had performance art. And I was DJing. We had lights and lasers in this tiny little bodega that looked like Studio 54. I mean, it was off the hook. So many famous people came. You know what I mean? Uh, and we ran it 15 years under the police's uh, nose because they wouldn't come after noon on Sunday night, but we had naked go-go boys. I mean, everything illegal, except for the drugs. I kept the Coke out of there. I realized there were going to be Coke problems, and I went to one dealer, and I said, you are the king of Coke here. Any other dealer cannot work here, and if I find you dealing Coke here, you're out of here. You do your business. You take them outside, down the block. You keep it clean, and if you see another dealer here, you let me know, and we'll go get security to get them out of here. Here. And he kept it clean for 15 years. He yeah, wasn't going to jail. Man, you said, like, I want it respectable. I don't yeah, want I'm a respectable gangster when it came to that kind of stuff. I want, I want, I want I'm a respectable about? business. I kept the Coke out of there and only had one dealer. But I was smart enough to realize that there was going to be Coke. And if there was Coke, I would lose my money and everybody else that worked underneath me because we had a staff and all that on Sunday night, which ran independently from the bar. They were going to get fired too. And I was responsible for other people's livelihoods. If you do no Coke, no one's going to show up. It's a nightclub business, right? DJs, we know about this, right? So that's how I kept it Everything clean. goes. And kept it clean and all that kind of stuff. So Grand Theft uh, uh, Auto comes out, and one of the DJs comes up to me and says, You know, your stuff's in Grand Theft Auto, the video game. I said, Wow. He goes, uh, 
you have a PlayStation? I said, no. He goes, I'm going to lend you the money to get a PlayStation in the game. and lend me two or $300. I get it. I put the cartridge in. I'm playing. I get in the car. I turn on the radio. Hip Hop Bebop is one of the things. And I flipped out. He says, I have a lawyer that'll take you on, you know, what a, not commission, but uh, what do they call it when, when, when? The word is everyone contingency. On contingency. Take your own contingency. So we wound up suing them. And they realized that they would have to, Unidisc, Frank Kukazawa, would have to produce um, canceled checks and the actual document that I signed. So they had very smart lawyers. And I had gone to a lawyer with my friend, Michael Radeski, who's the guy who died in Boy George's apartment. It just keeps going on. It doesn't stop. Um, uh, uh, and they said back in 96, I, I, I went with Michael. He was talking about, I think it wasn't working with Boy George, it was working with, no, he was doing a, I think he was doing a James Brown record or something, writing something and needed some legal advice. And they said that I had gone up to this particular lawyer in 96 and asked him about Hip Hop Bebop, which I didn't do. The lawyer lied. And because of that, I was outside of my statute of limitations or the time allowed by law to make a claim, which is six years. So if anybody's a songwriter out there and I steal your record, no matter who I am, a little guy or a big guy, you only have six years to make a claim. After that six years, you're done. I thought it was I thought it was a seven year look back. It's only six. It's six year look back. It's okay. a six year look. But so, there are there are ways around it. So what I did, I lost that case. We took it to Supreme Court. The judges didn't understand. There was six or seven New York State Supreme Courts. One of them was this 40 year old Latin guy. And they're saying no. And he's fighting with this is main parish. You don't understand. At the end of it, they said, you know, case against you. You couldn't prove it, whatever. And the judge stood up and said, Mr. Parrish, I'm sorry. I've listened to your stuff from way back in the day. These old farts, he didn't say farts, but these old people don't understand what's going on. I'm sorry you didn't get justice today. But there is a way around all this. You do a trademark under your name. And trademarks go all the way back to the very first time you used your name, which is that Andy Warhol thing in 1976 and 1978. So if you made Coca-Cola in 1912 and you have a claim against you in 19... 19- 2014, it goes, there's no statute of limitations on a trademark as long as you keep your trademark active. So it's a way to fight back when other people, I mean, my, my stuff is bootlegged. There's a guy, Man Paris, P A R I S H, you know, that goes around giving interviews as Man Paris. You know, I mean, it's like, it's thanks for, it's great. I'm thankful, but, you know, it creates problems. Like you said that you hate. Egyptian people are like, hey, what? Well, man, Paris said right here. I said, that's one arm. That's not two. He didn't say that. But you know what I'm saying? It creates problems. So uh, you, you can get around stuff and also let people know if they're songwriters, after 33 years, you can reclaim your royal, you, you, the rights to your song. You just look it up. The Library of Congress will give you your music back after 33 years by, by law. But a contract well, wait, also... Let's ask con- the question. So on the sound recordings that you need this CAD that he purchased from Import 12. Yeah. What happens in that case legally with those sound... Even with the 33-year law? It, I- it, 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 the rights revert back to you, including the sound... They would have... At 33 years, they would have to buy a license from you. If you're making the, yep. I'm making the claim, Unidisc has to file a license to continue selling from that day, and anything before it is questionable whether the royalties come back to me or not. But right. from that January 1st, 2020 forward, if they don't get a license, then they're screwed. So between my trademark and that, you can't do a con- you could do a contract, and and if anybody signed one. There, there's it says for the sum of one dollar you have to pay if i do a contract with lenny i can't just say give me all your stuff see you later there has to be something coming back more than a promise see no i had to learn from being screwed i learned the music business i can't take your music and keep the royalties because it's not legal but what leg do you have to stand on well i gave you one dollar in exchange and you said okay my record contacts never had the and an exchange of one dollar, so they would have to show royalty statements, mechanicals, which is using my name, all these things, you know, uh, publishing things, and there's nothing there for forty-five. Well, I've been in the business fifty years, forty-five years. 
of stuff, but you can only go back six. But with a, but with a trademark, I can go all the way back. And um, I hope unit, yeah, you know, George Kukasoa's wife is sitting on a yacht taking uh, Kim Kardashian pictures and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I think that yacht's going to be mine one of these days. My God, I wish you luck on that one. I oh, know. at one point, I think he said he had, he owned the Bee Gees or something like that. Yeah, he bought, he, he, bought he, he, the he bought the light stuff. He bought the delight catalog. He's bought every. Well, like, well, a lot of that stuff was Henry Stone. And, and, and Henry Stone was another one. And, and, and my, I mean. Uh, Henry Stone, uh, uh, Warlock Records uh, was. Uh, uh, um, uh, I did Paul Parker's one look with them. Uh, uh, what was that guy? Uh, he was uh, 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 the mafia guys that were in the business. That was his son. I, I can't remember his name right now. Not Levy. Was it Morris Levy? Morris son? Levy. Yeah, Morris Levy. It was son was running Warlock Records, and yes. I, I, the industry was. It still is pretty bad. But the good thing that happened is music streaming. It's a bad thing and a good thing. We used to get four cents every time, or five cents every time it was played on the radio, a song. So you made a thousand, two, three, four thousand dollars on a small record, five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars, twenty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars with a really successful record. Now you get zero point zero zero two five cents a play. So I just got a thing from, you know, the million dollar, uh, a million record thing from iTunes. And I think the check was like $200 or something like that. But the good side of that is we don't need record labels anymore. I don't need to sign a contract. I have 140, 154 records as of today out on iTunes, and they're all mine. I put out what I want. I don't have a record label telling me it's no good. It sells. It doesn't sell. And I'm building a catalog. And at my age, it's not about me having the next dance hit. It's about my legacy. Because now I'm 64 years old. I don't look good in a spandex tube top with my belly hanging out. And I've got, you know, tight. Uh, uh, Come on, everybody. Uh, you know, with a potato send, sack hanging over one side of my leg. You wait, know, wait, wait, wait. Send me a parish, some, some family, ask him to come back out in that spandex gear. Come I, on. I would do it in a heartbeat. As a comedy routine, you know what I mean? You know, it's got a spandex tube top, pink yeah. glitter, uh, with, with sequins, you know, hair pulled up, you know, into a little a Tina Turner falcon, some makeup on. And tight spandex with a potato sack on one side of my leg, and I'd probably stuff it with three or four, you know, socks to make it ridiculously big, and then right. sneakers and a puka shell necklace. Got to have a puka shell necklace. You have to, you have to give us. I'm going to ask you to go back to 80, 81, around that time. And I know you, you know, we got everything after and what happened pre to hip hop. Be oh, there's way more than that. <laughs> oh, I'm saying pre to I know, I know. hip hop creation. What led you? And what was the driving force to make this record? I know the porn thing happened. What I thought Bebop was just an experimental piece of music with sound and beats. That's all that it was. It was a... This mixed so well. It's so... Well, well, wait, I was, I was, we'll, we'll talk about that. And there's a, re there's a very good reason for that, because I, I, I insisted on something. But... When an artist makes a painting, you don't draw, you just paint the Mona Lisa, you make sketches, you make pencil sketches. So Hip Hop Bebop was a pencil sketch on, in the future, how to do beats, how to do music. I was teaching myself rhythm. I had a lot of them, not just that, but I was teaching myself how to do rhythm and beats. I had done fa local fashion shows. I did uh, performance art things at the tunnel, at the mud club. Uh, later on, just recently, I did a sound installation at the prestigious Museum of Modern Art, and I'm in their permanent collection with three pieces, which is unusual for a musician. So the art art kind of stuff has been important. And I was teaching myself as an artist because I wasn't a musician. I had to be something on how to make music. So that's how Hip Hop Bebop came around. And the bags of Coke and the promotion and people like Curtis and all that kind of stuff made it happen. I walked away from the record company and... I was desperate, I mean, desperate for money. And I wound up doing Boogie Down Bronx. Come on, we'll just do another record. I said, bro, come on, we'll give you $200 instead of 100. I'm like, oh, all right. So there's a kid in the neighborhood. A, 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 a ben Sutter's was primarily a white neighborhood in those days. And John Carter, his dad, took care of the apartment, you know, the super for the, for the building around the block. And John knew Hip Hop Hip Hop was that. And he used to sit on my steps going, my man, man, perishing cool or old, cooler than the water in the swimming pool. And I'm like, 
okay, cool, kid. <laughs> so we went upstairs and we used to knock records out and a lot of those records were done in eight hours from scratch to, to, to finish to mixing. Um, okay, hang on, hang on. The menu as a chef, break it down. Everything that was gone into hip hop bebop. The, the okay, gear. so, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go, and please. I'll tell you why it sounds good. Por favor, please. Yeah, I'll tell you why it sounds good. So, um, I probably laid down, well, first of all, there were no programmable drum machines. So I couldn't play drums, a drum set. So I used to have a Roland CR-78, which is like bossa nova, jazz, rock, that kind of stuff. Roland came out with the 808, and I was like, wait a minute. I mean, I could make my own drum programs? So I suddenly realized I could be craft work now. I wound up, when I was at the store, there was this box in the window called a vocorder. And I said, what's that? He goes, that belonged to Electric Light Orchestra. They just recorded their album, you know, and they used it on Mr. Blue Sky. They don't want it. He goes, I don't know what it is. Give me $25. Well, that's the KTU vocorder. That's my whole voice because I didn't sing. So uh, hip-hop people, so I'm doing that stuff for a little retreat. Uh, so I put down the drums, and the drum had a trigger out. You could program... The rim shot, dum da da dum da dum da da dum, and that would create electronic pulse that I could plug into my synthesizer, which accepted that, and the bass line would go boom, 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 and you would either play or program in the little step sequence of boom, 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 whatever your bass line was. So there was no MIDI, there were no computers. I had an eight-track half-inch tape recorder, and um, uh, I recorded direct to it, bypassed the board. I would plug my stuff into the back of the tape. I'd reach around the back and plug in the drum machine or plug in the keyboard. So it bypassed any of the circuitry in the board. I tried to get it as pure as possible. I don't know what I was doing, but something told me to do that. And a lot of it was, if you're into recording, which I am, and obviously you have a studio, eight track half inch Ampex tapes, four, 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 six, I can't remember, um, would, would, would saturate. You're, putting, you're going into the red in layman's terms. And it would give a warm, fuzzy warmth to it, right? So uh, finished the rest of it. It was just a, a tone poem. I don't know what to call it. With a beat. And Raul Rodriguez came to listen to all these cassettes. I don't even know if I had a DAT machine by then. I may have. Maybe not. These cassettes. What's that? What's that? And I said, oh, that's a beat thing. Let's, l let's do that. Put this on this checklist. So we had that album for the songs. And... I was living on 14th Street and 9th Avenue, and I remember putting a shopping bag, a, a garbage bag over it, and carrying my 8-track half-inch 80-pound task cam on the subway because I couldn't afford a taxi from 14th Street to Vanguard Studios on 21st Street. And a quick side note, Vanguard Studios was like the Muscle Shoals was in the South, where Aretha Franklin, Vanguard did all the Alicia and AEIOU and Man Parish and Soul Sonic Force and Arthur Baker you can get the studio for $25 an hour or $100 all night or something like that. That's now the Gotham Comedy Club, but that space should have a plaque on the wall for all the serious major records that came out of it. And when I remember I took it into the studio, Mark Berry, who's an engineer, I didn't even know him. He starts plugging. I said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm patching it through the patch bay. We'll do it through the board and equalizer. I said, no, you're not. And they're looking at like, who's this kid? You know, I said, you're going to take the output of my tape recorder and plug it into the input of your tape recorder because in those days, when you made a copy of a copy, it degraded. Now we do digital copies, it's exact, but it's a generation away. And I was trying to preserve, because it had to be mixed from there, then it had to be mastered, and then it had to be turned into a master press, and then negative press, and then a record. So you're five, six, seven generations away, I want to keep it as clean as possible. So what you're hearing on Hip Hop Bebop that sounds so full, and that Arthur Baker had an issue with, <laughs> like how come it sounds better than mine? Is because when I uh, <clears throat> when I recorded, I went straight to the tape machine, and when we went to the twenty four track because we needed more tracks, I came out of my tape recorder and went straight into the twenty four track to to try to preserve it. So it kept that warmth. You know, I did. There was an MCI board. It was a uh, MCI machine and board, which I think Sony made. That studio had a reverb plate, and I think maybe I don't even think digital delays were happening then. You know what I mean? There was noise reduction on that tape machine and no, DBX. Noise? I never used it. I didn't like the noise reduction because okay. I thought it compressed the sound that took away the high frequencies. I had it, but I never turned it on. 
I'd rather live with the hiss and hear hi hats than turn on the noise reduction and it's like a hi hat with a with a sock over it. You know what I mean? And because you only had eight tracks, so that's why a lot of this is very very simple. Um, is uh, track one was kick, uh, it was drums. You'd, you'd mix it with the little 808 things and get that balance. Uh, track two is bass. Track three and four and five were keyboards and sequencers. And we'll talk about how he's six sequencers. Oh, my God. And track seven and eight were vocals. You could do a vocal. And then if you had background vocals, you'd have to invite your friends because three people would sing around the microphone because you wouldn't have three tracks of vocals. And that was a lot of the records that we did. And sometimes you'd bring the tape recorder in and and, and do more. So in Hip Hop Bebop, we, 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 we put on the 24-track, and then there's no song structure there. What are we going to do for lyrics? Oh, right. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Turn the tape recorder on. I'm barking. Roll's barking. Uh, <coughs> uh, all right, rewind, rewind, rewind. A two, three, four, punch. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And we did that for five or seven or eight minutes, whatever that was on there. And what else are we going to do? Um, how about a how about a hoe? I said, how about a hey ho? How about your mama's a hoe? No, we get that. How about a hey ho? Hey ho, hey ho. Seven or eight minutes. And uh, don't stop, bebop. You know, and we did tr layers of these things, filling up all those empty tracks <laughs> and talking and making it realistic and all the stuff that we had on there. And then it came time to mix it. How do you mix something that doesn't have a verse, a chorus, a bridge? So we took three or four 10 inch reels of quarter inch tape. Let's do this mix with the drums out. This one with the, the bass and just the keyboards. And this, it breaks down to just the claps. And they took it to Mike Wilkinson's house for a weekend and did a Coke and beer binge and edited that together. And they played it for me. And I went, you have a song? Oh, it's great. You're going to hear it. And I listened to it and I went, you can't, you can't put this out. This isn't a song. There was nothing like it on the radio. Everything had, even Planet Rock had a verse and a chorus and a bit. There's nothing here. You know, D don't worry, you know, don't worry, you know, little bags of coke. Don't worry, we'll get it happening. And that's a lot of the story behind Hip Hop Beep. I kept saying, put more bass in it. We can't put bass in it because if you put bass on a vinyl record, if you put too much, the the, the needle will jump out of the groove. Right. That was, oh, yeah, that was the old, the old saying. Well, no, no, no. And I said, well, who makes that happen? He goes, well, that's done at mastering. I said, I'm going to master it. Goes, right. No, you're not. They charge us an extra $50 if you sit there. I said, I'm going to the master. And they're, we're going to get Herbie, Herbie Pump Powers on German Teledeck vinyl. You know what I mean? I promise you it'll sound good. And I said, Herbie, can you pump the bass? And he was like, really? You want me to? And I'm like, yeah. And he may, you, you can decide how wide, when you press a record, how wide those grooves are apart. And he put in enough groove that the bass signal did not touch the next groove and cause the needle to jump out of the record. And there was a record by, uh, uh, um, a pop music by M that had alternated grooves. I still have it somewhere. But if you put the needle down, it was one song. But if you moved it, a groove later, it was a completely different song because they made the groove so far apart that every other groove was the song, but the groove in between was a completely other song. So I, 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 it blew me away. So I used to go to all my mastering and Herbie loved me because I said, pump the bass, pump the bass. And it was Herbie, pump powers. You know what I mean? That's how he put that on there. Yeah, he goes, pump the bass, pump the bass. Um, because because if, if you're a tech guy, uh, um, what's his name? Oh, Richard Long had had 30 inch woofers these speaker cabinets which were at the palladium later on were at the fun house those speaker cabinets with the size of a king size bed and they were big enough to walk into and a 30 inch woofer is you know my arm is 30 inches long you know the the, the woofer was like like, like <laughs> you get you get the idea they were massive and they produced super low frequencies and i wanted those cabinets to hit you in the chest where you couldn't breathe so, uh, you know, I said, Herbie, for the Richard Long sound system, the garage had it, the Saint had it. Can I can I clarify what that is, everybody? So he's talking about the Bertha speakers with the extensions to get that bass that would kick you right in the chest. Yeah, there were 30 inch woofers, and I think they were faced backwards and they folded and then came forward. Forward design. Yeah, it's a W. Yeah, and if you're an old school person, there was always some guy or girl tripping his brains out standing in front. Mars had one of those speakers. 
There's a club called Mars on 13th Street. And they just had one of the woofers and it took up like a quarter of the dance floor. Yeah. And people would use it as a stage, but you'd stand in front of it and it would like, you couldn't breathe. It was so much air pressure coming out of that. It was, of course, amazing. And to this day, I push the low end. I, I am a bass whore. I mean, I love 80 cycles. So I mean, that, low get, end, that low end came from her powers? He When he EQ'd it? When he mastered it for you? No, well, well, well it came from the purity. You, know I mean? you gave the pre-master with enough bass. So you well, said. Well, it came from the purity of that stuff. And as we're mixing, I kept saying, pump the bass, pump the bass, pump the bass. Put the high end up. I am legally, almost legally deaf. I have 20% mid-range hearing in both ears. I just came back yesterday. There's a place that's doing a, a sound study where they shoot your ears with a, I don't know if it's Propecia or biogenetically engineered. I mean, if I grow a big bowl, you know, third eye, you'll know it. But it, it, they think I'm in a clinical study where it's going to restore your hearing. And not because I'm in Paris, just because I have. If you look at a graph, I'm 80% loss in my mid-range frequencies. Is that for from birth? Is that all that? No, it's from standing in front of those fucking speakers. And I mix with, um, I don't have any head, uh, any any, any um, speakers in my studio. Since these came out, I, I mix with- Sony's? The Sony's. That's my whole reference. Now, you can mix on a pair of Oratones. You can mix on giant- you know, clips, million dollar, you know, million oh, sound system speakers, right? But ends, all that stuff. It's your point of reference. So my point of reference are those. And that's how I mix. So I get a lot of volume close to my ear. And it, you know, I survived disco. It, 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 it took out a lot of my hearing. But, um, but, but, but now I can mix. Uh, where's, look, guys, get this open. There's, you know, this is my software, and where am I? Over here. These, that's my my mixing part of it. I, I work in Apple Logic. It's kind of like flying a plane. I know 60, 80 cycles pumps those speakers. You know, 10, 20 K is the hi hat sizzle and all that kind of stuff. So I can do a lot of it, even though I can't hear it, by, you know, by by what I know. And now I'm doing high definition audio, the 96 K masters for title and all that, and Manparish.com is up online. Go. There's a lot of things. Yeah, run there, everyone. Manparish. You can even play Centerpede. Yeah, there's a physics lab. I try to make it a playground. There's lots of videos. You can see guys with their schwanzes hanging out for my sperm party, which got me thrown over YouTube. There's a lot of fun stuff up there, plus all the original stuff. Bunch of interviews, Larry. This one, Lenny's uh, interview is going up and all that. Um, but uh, 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 I'm going to start selling high-definition audio because MP3s drive me crazy. Oh, they were always horrible. They squash everything. And why don't you do vinyl? DJs, please let me explain this, please. Oh, yes. Man Parish, why don't you do vinyl? To a couple of different reasons. I can't. That stuff is all mastered by somebody somewhere. I can't fly there and sit down. I, I, I can send a master, right? I, I, I master here for digital. I could probably master for vinyl, but some... 20 year old, a 30 year old is going to roll off the low end because they're afraid it's going to be blah, 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 and you cue it the way they want it, and I'll lose my mind. Then I have to press records. And to be efficient, you have to press a thousand records, maybe get 500. Then you have to shrink wrap. Them. Then you have to print the covers. So the reason why records are $25, $30 is because that's a big expense. And say I didn't promote it properly, or my listeners don't buy vinyl. I now have 2,000 records sitting in my living room, you know, in my studio here. And it'll cost me $300 to ship 20 of them to Germany to a record store. And it's getting to the point that it's just so expensive. And you'd be lucky if you sell 1,000 records. It isn't like the old days where you'd go to the distributor. And for you record guys, the distributors wouldn't pay you on your record until you sold your next record. If it sold, then they would take the money from the previous one and pay you. It's like record labels. And it's just yeah, but Man Parish, 1,000 units for our promo mail out. For Dude, stars. I mean, we used to do record pools. I remember. 5,000 to record pools. Yeah. You know, but I, I'm looking at, you know, you know these Madonna singles and stuff, and they're giving them gold records for like, was it 25 or 30,000 records? I mean, I sold hundreds of thousands, you know, a couple of million. You know, I, I would love, if, if vinyl... It was as easy as MP3, and I can get it to you 
on a special DJ mailing thing, you know, I'd send it out to everybody, but you all spend five or $10,000 and make 300 back. So it doesn't make economic sense when I can deliver you high quality stuff and you can either MP3 it, or if you want to print vinyl, great. And that being said, I'm going to offer stems on my website of my songs. So you're going to have the vocal mix, a drum mix, a keyboard mix, a bass mix, and you can go in and mix it yourself or delete one of those tracks and do your own remix. And I'll probably let you put it out. I'm going to sell the original samples to hip hop bebop. Uh, there's not that many, believe it or not. Uh, 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 things like Boogie Down Bronx, I don't have the masters for, but now there's uh, um, algorithms that let you separate vocals and keyboards and stuff. And you can have them, you know, 20 bucks, whatever it is, $25. And you can go put out your own versions of my records because I'm not getting paid for it. I might as well have 30 versions out there that people are listening to it. I can't do a trap, you know, version of Boogie Down Bronx, but maybe somebody can, and it's going to reach a bigger audience. So, you know what I mean? So, uh, um, but the sound, I was very adamant about the quality and the sound of hip hop, bebop, and I'm, I'm a nerd for, for quality, you know? And now that we have higher bit rates, if you listen to my stuff at MP3, it sounds pretty damn good. I master it myself, making sure the compression is right. You listen to the 96K or the stuff on Tidal, the masters that I'm starting to put out there. It's like, whoa. It's like, wow. Like a whole other world of audio opened up. So I'm I, I'm down with OPP when it comes to that. Did anyone, you know, because I remember you saying that you were doing stuff out of your loft. Um, did any, did you have anyone show you anything? Or was it just, you just what, like their um, penis? What are you talking about? Besides, well, besides that, we know that I'm talking about engineering and stuff. Did anybody give you? No, any because no, because on your way. B b because of the abuse that I had, I was socially, somebody said I was reclusive. I wasn't reclusive. I was damaged. I didn't know. All my friends were damaged. And at one point I said to somebody, what do you mean you've had friends for more than three months? Oh, I've had friends for five years. My friends would leave me, the normal ones, after three months because I was broken. I was damaged. I was needy. I was a mess to be around, right? So nobody taught me anything. I had to, oh, I'm listening in my headphones, the playback of the cassette. The bass is distorted. Oh, I pushed it to 11. Maybe I should bring it back to eight or nine. You know what I mean? And trial and error, error, error. I've been in the business 50 years making music. I better have my shit together. You know what I mean? I, I'm, I, I figured it out. And as the technology expands, I mean, if I pull down my, uh, not my pants, folks, don't get excited. If I pull down my plugins, I probably have 300 plugins. I have about 20 or 30 reverbs that are used for different. This is a great vocal reverb. This is a great drum reverb. This is a good synthesizer for dance. This is an ambient synthesizer, all that kind of stuff. So I keep up with technology. I'm 64 years old. I'm, I'm still 12 years old when it comes to gear. You know, I, I have a, I have in yeah. Tom Moulton is in his 80s and he's still. I know, I know, I know. Well, I see his stuff. I have a storage room that's built to the top of all analog gear, and people keep asking me to buy it. And I'm like, I don't want to sell it. I want to see if the Brooklyn Museum will give me a closet in the corner and I can put it behind plexiglass on a shelf. I have Georgia Moroda's original MC8 micro composer that he used on uh, on, um, um, on Donna Summers' I Feel Love. I have Mr. Blue Sky. Uh, I, I, I can't think right now, but I have a couple of them. Oh, Patrick Cowley synthesizer he used on Do You Want a Funk and, 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 and the Paul Parker stuff. I was supposed to do Sylvester's music, and Sylvester turned me down because I did synthesizer music. He had Do, do You Want a Funk, but Sylvester did not want to be an electronic artist. He wanted to be a black R&B artist, and he wanted real drums, so he turned me down. I was supposed to do Divine's next record. He went out to California. It was going to be Peg's mother or uncle on Married with Children. And I met with his manager that night before the first day of filming. He choked on a sandwich and died. And I was going to have the next Divine record and finally get paid. Uh, a lot of crazy, a lot of crazy stuff. A lot of crazy. I came down from the ceiling at Studio 54. Madonna was my, my opening act. Uh, Boy George, Michael Jackson, and all these people, not Boy George, uh, Michael Jackson, Henry Kissinger, Bianca Jagger, Mick Jagger, all these dropping names I could just, you know, they were in the audience. And after the show, there's a funny story. You can go to manparish.com. I got stuck up at the top. I came down from the ceiling. I got stuck up there for about a half hour and flipped out and 
it's a funny story that I tell. Go to Man Paris um, or Man Paris Stories on YouTube. Either one of that has it. And I talk about how I'm hanging up there above the audience, screaming, having a panic attack because they forgot about me. The DJ was a diva and didn't want to stop the music, and I was stuck all the way up in the rafters. But um, after the show, I get this um, these bodyguards come up and go, Mr. Jackson wants to talk to you. And I said, oh, my God, I did something bad. The owner must be Mr. Jackson, one of the owners, and is going to talk to me in the in his office. And we go downstairs, and we're coming out in, into the room, and I'm like, well, this is weird. And we turn up to the side, a little VIP area, and it's Michael Jackson. And he was big because he had Thriller, but he wasn't the king of pop big. He was big, you know what I mean? And I remember because we were battling on the dance chart. And he said, hello, pleased to meet you. You know, I'm Michael. And I said, I am Manny. He goes, I know who you are. And I said, oh, okay. And he said, um, I really like your music and your show. And I said, well, thank you, thank you, sir. He goes, no, 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 you call me Michael. I said, okay, Michael, thank you very much. He goes, I'm doing a new record. Uh, and uh, it was it was the um, um, uh, uh, the Bad Album. I uh, found out later when it came out. because it's a song called Speed Damon, and I'd like you to... to to put a, 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 you know, your spin on it. And I said, okay. He goes, okay, okay. Well, someone will be in touch with you. And like the security guards pick you up and take you away. So I went, oh yeah, checks in the mail. So about two weeks later, Raul calls me, Quincy Jones, Q West call. And I went, what do they want with us? He goes, he does Michael Jackson. I went, oh my God. So we went into, um, went into the, the hit factory on 54th Street, down from Studio 54. And they put the tape on and we did a hip hop bebop version of an 808 version of Speed Demon. And I remember you're a recording engineer. Some of you guys record. He's singing, and I'm, I'm, I'm hearing this. And I'm like, what? Is, they said that's the wrong track. Michael would stand in the, in, in, the, in the DJ booth and stomp his feet in time. And it was as he's singing. So it took us like an hour or two just to gate out the kick, but leave his voice there. All the backgrounds are mixed. Michael Jackson hated it. Quincy Jones liked it, but it was Michael's record, and it's sitting in a vault somewhere in, at Sony. Michael wanted to be more street credible, and he was looking at those street artists to stay in touch. After Prince died, some guy contacted me on Facebook and said, I used to work with Prince. He listened to your music. And I'm like, yeah, okay. you know, I, you know Whatever. Whatever. And he's like, no, 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 I'll prove it. And he sends me pictures at Paisley Park with him sitting behind the console and Prince is here, and like four or five or six. I'm like, but now all of a sudden I'm your friend, right? You know, it's like, really? What did he say? Hi, hey, buddy. He said, Prince used to listen to a lot of street music to stay in touch. And he said, he really knew your stuff. And I'm like, blown away. He goes, I heard your story that you never got paid. He said, if Prince was alive today and knew that, he would have paid for lawyers and he would have got your rights back and you would have gotten you paid and that he had done that for many people before anonymously you'd have to agree that you wouldn't reveal his name for him to do that right i was i mean i'm a big prince fan who is that right yeah purpleness wow holy shinoli you know wow yeah been around the block a few times re laid relayed parlayed and souffle so, hey, so everybody got to realize this too not only is he an accomplished writer, producer, he also gets into the management side of the business. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, so yeah. I get a call. I get a call from we had we had the man to man song out in England, a uh, 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 male stripper. And I'll, I do this record for 50 bucks. I know Paul's own and Mickey's own. They were friends from the neighborhood in Brooklyn. Come on, man. We have a record for $50. We, want, we have our own little label. And little, little, little. Okay. I get a uh, I get a, a call like eight months later. Your record's climbing the charts. It's on top of the pops, which is like American Bandstand, and it's going to be number one pop in, in Europe. I said, what record? Male Stripper? I said, I never did a song, Male Stripper. He goes, the open billboard, Male Stripper, Man to Man, Meet Man Parish. And I went, I just had records out in England, and he used my name to get his record sold, didn't ask me. Took me months to find out. That turned into a whole fiasco where I went over to England, and the guy from the record company said I was sleeping with Madonna and we had a whole week on the front cover of the newspapers that I was, I mean, crazy stories. Like she sneaks into my house with my maid who puts a rug over her head, a blanket over her head. Crazy. Go to Man Paris. Stories Did it on really happen? Here. What? 
was it was it just made up the stories? Yeah, made up stories because because they wanted the record to climb the charts, and it did. And then I thought, this is you know, this is going to be I'm going to get sued. So we wound up going into a hotel room, and he said, well, we're going to get a hotel room with with with, with the balconies. Um, I've been on the front cover of the Standard. I was on the front cover of the News of the World, which is like the National Enquirer, and a couple of other pages for a week. We were so poor that we would have breakfast, lunch, and dinner interviews because we knew that, that they would pick up the tab so we could eat. And then, can we drop you off at the hotel? Oh no, we're at the you know we're at the uh, the Palace Hotel, and we'd get on the subway and go back to Earl's Court in a place where you had to put five cents into in the room in a little meter to get heat. And I'm sitting on the subway, and right across the street, away from me, and it's like. One of those comedy things. The guy sitting here reading a newspaper, and right here is my face on the front cover of the paper. Crazy. Wait, 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 wait. Let's slow down. You were staying at the crappy hotel, but yet they were having you guys look like you were staying at the Palace Hotel. When I landed, when I landed, I can't believe. I had my hair was like all some guy that we used to say in Brooklyn. I had a white T-shirt on that was, you know. Uh, because I had been sleeping on a red eye and a pair of gray sweatpants and sneakers. And when I landed, this crazy queen, Nick Miles, and I still friends with him. Hello, darling. Welcome to London. I said, great. You're going to do some interviews. I said, what are you talking about doing interviews? Oh, no big deal. I told them you're sleeping with Madonna. I went, you told them what? Look at me. I look like hell. Oh, I told them you just, the Concord just landed and you just got off the Concord and you're so Fresh cool. as a daisy. Fresh as a daisy. No, you don't have to be fresh in the days. You're rock and roll. You tra- they're all traveling in business suits and you don't give a fuck. You know what I mean? So <laughs> so I went, I'm not doing this. He says, if you don't do that, they'll destroy you in the press. I said, I'm tired. I want to go. Left. Don't worry. It'll be five minutes. I said, give me your sunglasses. I put them on. Put on the sunglasses. We go across the street to a hotel. These press people follow us. There's one of those daises where they set up those like tables. like. Yep. like and I, I, I get behind it and sit down. The first person is woman. So, what's it like sleeping with Madonna? And I went, oh, my God. And, and I'm trying to, you know, you, you <laughs> keep the stone face, and I'm looking at the floor. And he goes, man, he's got scratch marks on the back because he does it so good to her that she's, ugh. And I said, I look at it like, what? Next question. What about Sean Penn? While they're having sex, they laugh at him. He's poison pen. He's uh, he's history. Oh God! Oh my God! Oh my God! How does how does Madonna get to Manny's house? Well, he's got a a maid called Beulah. She has an old Ford. She wraps Madonna in a blanket, a a rug or a blanket in the back of her old Ford. Pulls right next to the house. The door opens up, and Madonna sneaks in so nobody can see it. And they have sex for hours and hours and hours. Oh my God. And a few more questions, and we're out of there. And I thought, this is so, so crazy. So crazy. No one's going to print this. I remember I, I jet lag, knock on the door, open it up. He throws three newspapers down on the bed. Madonna uh-huh. longs for my baby at the bottom corner on the front cover of the paper. And a couple of other things in the newspaper. And I went, oh, my God. He goes, you want to have breakfast? I said, I'm starving. I said, I don't have any money because I haven't been paid or anything. He said, don't worry, don't worry. I, 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 I managed an interview at Peppermint Park, I think it was called. Where you can have American bagels and locks, creatures and locks. And I went, what kind of an interview? He goes, oh, it's just a follow-up. Some people are going to ask questions. So we did breakfast, lunch, and dinner at the same place where the staff knew us because wow. we could have really good food and they would pick up the tab and they would offer to drive us home. Like, no, we have a limousine waiting outside around the corner. Take us back to the palace. We get on the subway. And I remember you had to put money in just to have the heat come up, it was so. It was a, it was a crack hotel because that's what the record company uh, uh, um, uh, money they allowed uh, paid for. You know, so that's how they treat their rig. That's how they treat the guy who's shag- rock and roll, baby, rock and roll. He's so, not a shagger, and he's get, he's not staying in any palace. Palace. Yeah, right. well, I mean, there were small record company bolts. Uh, this right. guy Nikki, I can't remember his name from Bolts Records. Then thing in a two star, no less than one star. It's like almost a hostel for that. Yeah, matter. exactly. It's one step up. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So and, it was in a gay, and, and he put me in a gay neighborhood, thinking, <laughs> well, at least it's a gay neighborhood. You should be happy. I'm like, <laughs> so I I came home after all that, you know. The, my getting calls from my father in Brooklyn. 
there's some national uh, individual magazine. I said National Enquirer. He goes, yeah. And and something entertainment, entertainment, entertainment tonight. He goes, yeah. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. <laughs> so, Mad Madonna's brother Chris had a, had a cable show in in Chicago, and he wanted me to come on the show. And really, you're sleeping with my sister? Come on the show. Let's talk about it. I'm like, no, 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 no. I said, we can't do this anymore. I'm not doing any more of this. I'm, I, I didn't know if you can get sued. You can't, but I didn't know at that time. Of course. So, so he, he says, I got a perfect idea. We're going to put you in a hotel room. We're going to find one with balconies that, 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 that connect. I'm going to put you in bed with a girl. Just take the shirt off. We'll give her a tube top and keep the cover. Make it like a ha making love, having sex. And I'm going to have the photographer crawl out on the balcony and get the exclusive shot of you cheating on Madonna. So, of course, you know, I'm screaming at, hey, and they shoot a picture and they put it in the newspaper and it's all over. Randy Jones from the Village People calls me a couple of months later. The Village People are playing at Spectrums in Brooklyn. And I know Jay, the owner, Spectrums used to be 2001 Odyssey, where they shot Saturday Night Fever, which we did a KTU show for for $2 million and blew it. Uh, that's a whole other story. But um, 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 it was, uh, they're playing, and I thought, we used to call it rectums, right? It, was, it turned from a stripper bar into a gay bar. Yes. I said, eh, I, 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 you know, it's, I'll get on my motorcycle. It's 10 minutes from my house. I'll go. It's, I can get it. I got it free anyway, but I'll go see it. And I remember seeing them going, wait, these guys are really singing live. All right, all right, I'll do a record. I up doing a record. Came out in Australia. Did really well. Um, and then Randy called me again and said, we need a road manager for they didn't have any management we need a road manager slice manager you know uh, to go to australia it pays a thousand dollars a week and everything completely is food but everything is included that's just profit and i said i'll do it and he said what what do you mean you'll do it don't you know anybody he said no 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 i want to go to australia i'll do it and that right. led to six years on the road we did iceland we did over, we did an overnight to Japan for a TV What's My Line with Tabitha, the young Tabitha who grew up from, from Bewitched. We mm -hmm. did months at a time in Australia, South America. I traveled the world for free, the best education I ever had. We had George Michael's tour bus in England, which is a double decker. You know, I flew the Concorde and then went home on the subway and took my welfare stamps. I mean, before I got paid. Yeah, I went from welfare to the Concorde to yeah, great, crazy rock and roll kind of stuff like that. And um, after that, was oh, I, I woke up one day six years later and in my bed and I went, oh, my God, I, I didn't recognize where I was because I was groggy. I'm late. Where are the guys? I got to get to the plane. I'm going to be in trouble. We're going to miss our international flight. And I went, you know what? I don't have any friends. My cat doesn't even know who I am. I'm <laughs> never home. I'm out every weekend. It's enough. And um, I made a little bit of an issue. <laughs> shall I say, but I broke away from it. Uh, Vito Bruno was a manager with Crystal Waters. I wound up working with her and a couple of other people uh, uh, as management because six years on the road with village people. When I started, we cut five or six, ten, I don't think it was high, it was five or six thousand dollars to do a ten minute, three song show. And I said, guys, I'm a record producer. You're singing to dub side instrumentals. Why don't I reproduce your show? Let's turn this into an hour-long show. We went from a $5,000 act to a $35,000 act, and we're suddenly playing corporate events. We played halftime at the rugby, which is the football of the world, in Sydney Stadium. We were the halftime. Wow. Instead of having Janet Jackson, it was village people, you know what I mean? And uh, We played in Iceland, and we went in on a Tuesday. It was supposed to come out on a Thursday. It snowed the next night over the windows. We, we were stuck in Iceland for a week. You know, uh, I, I was in East Berlin when the wall was up and we did a TV show and we came back. They had our passports and they said, OK, now you're doing next show. And I said, no next show, the guy's saying, give me the money. You know, why are the money? I have your passports. If you don't want to get stuck in East Germany, Berlin for the rest of your life, you do another show or you don't go back to the West. <laughs> right. And I remember going to the guy saying, hey, guys, we got a problem. And they're, oh, I'm not doing it. I said, well, you can stay here. I'm going to put on your outfits and I'm going to sing it. So, sure. yeah, a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of fun. But at that point, I knew management. We played a place in Texas where the guy didn't forgot to go to the bank. 
and had to get a pillowcase and open all the cash registers. See, I'm putting Lenny to sleep. Look at that. I'm doing good. No. I had to take the cash registers, no. and I had a bag of twenty thousand dollars of quarters, nickels, dimes, one, five. How do you? So how do you? Uh, wait a minute. They're giving you that kind of money, and what do you do? Go back to the back room, start counting everything. Yes. Yes. The show was delayed forty five minutes to an hour. The, the, the most of the change was in rolls, so you could do that. I said, "Give me a." We I later traveled in my bag with a money counter like they like like crack dealers have. But at that time, I'm I'm like a bank teller now from doing that. I used to do this, and and I, my promotion nights, I used to be able to count out stuff and pay people. So yeah, I I counted out twenty thousand dollars in one ten five twenties, and I said, "Put this in something." And he comes to me like a with, with a with a it was a pillowcase. And then when I went to the hotel, it was a nice hotel they put us in. I said, can I please speak to the manager? <laughs> I said, I have $20,000 on a pillowcase. I'm not a drug dealer. We're the village people, as you know. And I said, the guy paid us. Can you use cash for your <laughs> every day? Sure, you got 10s and 20s. We love right. you. you know, when people use cash in those days, not credit cards. And they cashed out for large bills. And I went to the bank early the next morning by cab and I did a wire transfer back to New York. So I learned a lot of the management stuff, the shenanigans, the games, you know, I knew other promoters. I remember Grace Jones stories and two tons of fun. We were playing at the Copa in Florida. They had a sister place in, 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 um, in, in uh, Key West. And we were supposed to get on the flight and they had Sylvester and two tons of fun, which is Martha Washington and Zora Washington. The three of them and some passengers got on the plane. The plane pulled out to the runway, comes back, and one of the girls got off. I said, what happened? They said, they exceeded the weight limit of the plane. What? <laughs> that was a little oh, my God. <laughs> How embarrassing was that? Yeah. Uh, Grace Jones, uh, the promoter said, you're on your own tonight. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, I can't find Grace. I said, what's going on? Uh, she went on a Coke binge. And, and 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 she checked herself out of the hotel and she has to be on stage in 20 minutes. And I've got to call every place, you know, to find out where, you know, where she is. I have a funny story with uh, in, in Club Boca in Florida. Village people were going to play. And I was in the in the office and he was, this is your limousine driver. And I said, oh, wait, I don't know if I could tell this story. He's still alive. Casey and the Sunshine Band, something happened in a white limo that turned brown. Let's put it that way when he met a, met a boy. And the guy didn't want to travel with us because he thought village people were going to do i got start i got some great stories i, I can't tell that one right now I can't tell that one right now yeah yeah but you can okay. imagine everyone the here we go back to the eccentric the word eccentric you take on the management and we're all thinking the superstar you were at that time too and yeah but i see i didn't have that ego because i always associated superstar like in the gay world, you had clones, guys who went to the gym had perfect bodies, but they all had attitudes. So I assume, assumed star or superstar as somebody who does he, who hasn't run earned the right to be a bitch. And I couldn't, I didn't think of myself as that. Remember, my mother told me when people die, it's my fault. So I had a lot of self-image problems. So people say, "Oh, you're the nicest guy ever," because I didn't have that attitude. Because I thought being nice. I'm just being me, that old oh, man Parrish kissed my ring. I'm sure you've done interviews with people that have attitudes. Oh, sure they do. Yeah, I, I, I would less suggest Well, that's it. But you know what? Everybody that comes on this show, I normally have a good relationship with. I don't get that. But I've seen it on other interviews. I think where... it's a defense mechanism for people that don't feel, that, that are very insecure. Hey, I've been through a lot of shit. Nothing's you can't cancel me. You can't tell me to do this or do that. I am who I am. If you don't like it, change the channel. I'm sorry. But, okay, that's why there's menus in restaurants, right? <laughs> you know what they say? So that's the way I look at it. I'm just me. Enjoy the entertainment. If not, that's okay. I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. Um, but I can't walk around and go, I'm Man Parish or I'm Beyonce or I'm this person. I'm that, you know. I'll get in the studio with Beyonce, see if she could write a record in 20 minutes. You know, I mean, I could probably get something. I'd love to do a TV show like, uh, you know, these cooking shows, but I want to have producers and I want to have kids come in. And today we're doing country music and you have, you know, the next five hours to produce a record. Tomorrow it's going to be a jazz tune and then it's going to be a dance tune and then it's going to be a rock tune. And the person at the end that could do all that wins the season ending and stuff. Why am I giving this away? Well, anyway, 
on Lenny's show, here we go, Lenny. We're going to make money. If somebody steals this, you and I are going to claim and, and, and split a couple of million dollars on my idea. But um, yeah, I, I, I did manage them because I wasn't selling records and I had to eat. Okay. Now, the question lies is this, with all that experience, we know you set up this new website and everything, and people are writing up, what's the plans from now to the end? Okay, I've been doing records since Hip Hop Bebop, folks. I've yeah, done- please oh, clarify course. that, clarify that. Yeah, I, I, so people know Hip Hop Bebop, Boogie Down Bronx, and I disappeared. I stopped doing music after I didn't get paid for about 10 years because I was... Hurt, really hurt you do it's your baby and your baby is taken away from you and it's everywhere and people go dude you did this record you do and you go oh my stop stop and it's like yes thank you but it hurts too much to realize what an idiot was i an idiot am i stupid you go through these head trips you know what i can't figure this out just make it go away and that's what I did for 10 years. Well, when you're in music, you can't really stop it. Then I DJed for my stuff. And then I got back into music once MP3s came out and I started releasing records. And because I had a name, which I didn't know, realize I had. I know it sounds crazy, but trust me, I wasn't. DJs love stuff that I'm doing, but I thought, okay, but other artists did too. So people started approaching me. You're you're the man parish? And I'm like, um, yeah, the yeah, yeah, that's me, Manny. Uh, could you do a record for me? I'm like, sure. I'm pretty. I've done everything from art and film scores, and I'm like, sure. So I started producing records again. I have 150 some four records. So going in the future, uh, more albums. I just put out this year. I put out three albums and about nine singles, and half of those are me. It's not hip hop bebop because I've grown since then. I do classical music. Uh, I've done ambient film scores, uh, 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 you know, chill out, vibe music, uh, um, dance music. Uh, Go to manparish.com. Actually, I'm going to be putting up the music in categories, but if you hit on radio, there's 154 tracks. You can hit the next button and listen to the whole variety of stuff that I've done. I just did my own music videos for the last album. My friend sang behind a green screen, and I did MTV quality effects behind it. So I'm not stopping anywhere. I tried to write a book. I couldn't. I'm too ADD. I had three writers come in and they were like, the aesthetics of Mr. Parrish's mental acuity to doing hip hop bebop. And I'm like, I'm from Brooklyn. You know, I laid down some beats and and it didn't work. So I did Man Parrish stories, which tells these stories and a lot of stuff that happened in my life. And that's my book. Right. So I hopefully that would be turned into a movie or, or a series. And I've talked about it before. Spider-Man is a kid who lives in Queens with his mother, goes out, saves the world, comes back. Man Parrish is a kid who lives in Brooklyn, goes out, hangs out with Andy Warhol. Uh, I remember sitting in Halston's house and there's, I'm going to drop names. There was Liza Minnelli, uh, um, um, Liza Minnelli, uh, Andy Warhol, my friend Linda, who was turned out to be the Quaalude dealer at 16 years old at Studio 54. That's why we got in. Me, Bianca Jagger, Mick Jagger, Truman Capote, Diana Greenman from Vogue magazine, and Liza Minnelli, and I don't do drugs, and they're passing around giant trays of Coke. <laughs> you know, no thanks, but it's Thanksgiving. Let me keep passing the right. And then this kid goes back to Brooklyn and lives at his mother's house and isn't a bitch. He's just Manny from Brooklyn that goes to Spumoni, that goes to Spumoni Gardens. Oh my God. So it wasn't until I started telling my story that things and the internet to really give you an indicator of how yeah. things really work. Yeah, I, I, I was I was managed by David Bowie's manager. Uh, uh, there's stories on there where I was invited to David Bowie's house and I'm sneaking through his underwear drawer. It's really hysterical and fun. Uh, I got to go to the studio at Electric Lady with my friend Cherry. But now, wait, uh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Man, you're selling Forrest Gump. Did you walk in on the moment with him and Mick Jagger? <laughs> Did I walk in a what? Did you um, as a joke? Did you were you the one that walked in the bedroom and found Mick Jagger and him? No, Mick- no, 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 no. Um, uh, I was a huge Bowie fan, and I knew he lived on Twentieth Street. My friend Sandy and I used to go sit on the front steps, thinking he'll come home and we'll get to see him and say hello. My friend Cherry Vanilla. Uh, was uh, worked with Andy Warhol. She had pink hair. We used to get crazy color from London 
in the seventies. My hair was green and purple before anybody's the punks were doing it. And yep. is that your natural color? I'm like, yeah. You know, y'all come over here and let's take a picture because they're not going to believe back in Texas that people in New York have green hair. Come on, honey, stand next. Oh, yeah. You know that kind of stuff. So uh, she did shows. Uh, there's a place in New York on Ninth and Sixth Avenue, Trudy Heller's, and I was helping her. I was 15, 16 years old, helping her like get dressed and carry her bags. You know what I mean? Because she was a star at that time. It didn't look good. She said somebody, she used to work for Bowie. She said, somebody important is going to come by today and there's going to be a commotion. You're a big guy. Can you stand by the door and block the door? Don't let anybody in. So I'm standing by the door and David Bowie walks in. It's like, oh, you know, I was a big Ziggy Stardust from the rock and roll days. So um, we wound up, it's too busy. It's too hot, too crowded. He, he, he came in with Ava Cherry, this beautiful, black girl with white hair and a very handsome man who I'll tell you in a second. We run around the corner to Jimi Hendrix studio, electric lady, and they're all in there smoking, doing coke, hanging out. And I remember there was a big synthesizer in the control room. I mean, in the studio. And I was more interested in the synthesizer that at that point when I saw David Bowie, but it was like squirrel. And I went over there to look at, went back and David and, and, and Bowie's leaning against the, uh, uh, against the mixing board. You know, everybody's coked out. You know, like this, and he said, uh, "Do you want to hear this new song that I did?" He said, "Yeah." He goes, "It's not mixed yet," and he kind of pushes the faders up, and he goes, "This guy over here did all the vocal arrangements and the background vocals. He's going to be famous one day. His name is Luther Vandross, <laughs> and he played Young Americans before that came out, and we got to hear that. Uh, a couple of months later, Cherry called me and said, because uh, she couldn't pay me, she said, uh, Angie Bowie, Bowie's wife." Uh, down the block over there. They're going to the circus. They have extra tickets. Do you want to go to see Ringing Brothers? I'm like, sure. Thinking Bowie's going to come along. We go to the house. It was a four-story house that they rented for him, RCA Records, or ma uh, Bowie's manager, who managed me later on. Uh, so weird, all these like six degrees of separation. Um, and we're sitting downstairs, and Angie said, oh, things are rough. David, David's tape recorder isn't working upstairs. And Terry goes, why don't you ask Manny? He's got tape recorders. He can fix Bowie's machine. And I'm like, I could go upstairs and look around. And I go, sure, I can fix it. So they're all downstairs. And and um, I remember going to the second floor. It was, the first floor was the kitchen and like a dining area. So it was narrow and two. Go up to the second floor, I think it was the living room. And I walk into the living room and, um, you know, it looked like the living room. And I'm looking around, turning over ashtrays. The third floor was the bedrooms. And I walk into the bedroom and I open the drawer and it's David's underwear. And I'm looking in the nightstand and I go into the bathroom and I'm opening the medicine cabinet, looking for pills and all that kind of stuff. And then I go up to the fourth floor, which is David's, it's a floor through, chill out. Now, David Bowie to me was Starman. He was Ziggy Stardust. And I wound up sleeping with the guy that did the Ziggy Stardust makeup. And Pierre LaRoche that wanted to take me back to Paris because I was like, a pretty 19 year old boy, but I was actually 17. Uh, that whole lot, he did the pin up space, he did the Rocky Horror makeup. And, Manny, I love you. You come to Paris with me. You know what I mean? But anyway, so I get up to the floor and I'm thinking, oh, he's like pad. There's going to be like a hyperbolic chamber and a transport pad and there's going to be, you know, smoke machine and all that. And I go up in there and Bowie used to be a folk singer, which a lot of people don't know. And um, there's like, macrame rugs and dream catchers and you know uh, uh indian blankets hanging out i'm like what the fuck what is this like where's the pod so it, that was the day i snuck around david bowie's house i went downstairs and i said i couldn't uh you know couldn't couldn't fix the tape recorder which i couldn't in the first place but i had to sneak around the house and later on one of cherry's friends was a road manager for david bowie and if you go to man parish studio Tony Zanetta talks about how he used to put the makeup on for Bowie when Bowie was like out of it, you know, so uh, he'd help Bowie get dressed and put the make the Ziggy Stardust makeup on and all that. So did it's you, all this weird. Did you, you know, about people asking, did you take the trip to Paris? No, no, I didn't take the trip to Paris because I wouldn't, I wouldn't even be able to get a, a passport. Uh, he was somebody that hung out and I knew who he was. And I must have been a little bit of a star fucker because I wanted to, you know, oh, he did the Bowie makeup. Well, I'm a Bowie fan. Well, if I sleep with you, I'm that much closer to Bowie. It was horrible. And I remember he was such a queen. He had 
an apartment and he had a kimono where they got from Japan on the wall above the couch. And I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. A kimono is a piece of art instead of a painting. And I thought, you're so cool. And he said, I love you, Manny. You come to Paris. He did Zoe, uh, uh, Ziggy Stardust, Z. He did the pinups and he did all the makeup for the Rocky Horror uh, Picture Show. And you can look up his name is Pierre LaRoe. She's gone now with AIDS. I know. It took a lot that of also time. happened too. I don't want to talk about it, take up more time in your show, but it was called Grid back in the day. That's right. Years. I read that too. That's exactly, I said the same thing. They used to call it Grid, the gay man's cancer. It was gay related immune deficiency. Right. And uh, friends like Klaus know me. Some of you may know, may not. He sang opera. I'm working on his new, I'm working on a new album with extracted vocals right now. I'm bringing him back to life. Um, but um, he uh, is one of the first people to get it. And we went up to Roosevelt Hospital. They didn't even call it grid then. Um, and we, we, we stepped out on the floor and there were biohazards and there was a piece of plastic set up and you had to put on gloves, masks, a cap, gown, pants and things over your shoes. And when you walk down the hallway, all the doors were slightly open. They all had that bioactive radiation sign on it. And it, don't touch him, don't go near him, but that, you know, we don't know what this is. And we walked in, Klaus was sitting up in the bed, watching TV, and he had Carposi sarcoma, all the, it looks like bruises, they're cancer under the skin, all over his body. Like, oh my God. And hi, Klaus, and he was like, real, you really scared, like, hi. And um, I went up and I hugged him. No, no, you're not supposed to touch me. I said, I'm a human being, no. You're going to get a hug. Come here. Nobody had touched him or hugged him in, in weeks and weeks and weeks. In those days, AIDS killed you within six months. Right. So there are people that I dated, personal friends, and a lot of people, because of gay shame, they were living on the third or fourth floor of their apartments, and they were too weak to walk downstairs and get themselves food, and people avoided them. They would call their family in Iowa or Kansas, I need to come home. I can't eat. I can't take it myself. You can't come home. You have AIDS and you're gay. What would the neighbors say? And it sounds funny now, but it was very, very true amongst thousands of guys that were like this. I think it was um, uh, 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 Geffen, David Geffen, that started God's Love We Deliver. They bought some ice cream trucks. They had a bunch of guys cook stuff, put it in takeout containers, and then volunteers would ride around and feed these guys. And a lot of my friends, I helped people as they died, literally as they died. I helped my sister in the hospital as she died. Oh. So I've seen it. Oh. But what makes doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So that's why you can't cult, can't culture me if I'm eccentric. Yeah, but that's what happens when you see life. I've <laughs> seen drag queens, I've seen people die, I've seen rock stars at this far apart. You know, I've had success and failures and hey, I'm still kicking. And I tell these stories to give people strength. So if you're in a funk and that record didn't make it, or you have 10 years of bad luck, you better hang in there and believe in yourself. And I know you hear this over and over, you know, just, just wish like Disney and your dreams will come true. But if you're Pardon, focused, you gotta have, you gotta have a positive, you, you, even as I believe it's a system, energy in, energy out. It's physics. If you look at it like physics, you put all this thought, you put all this hope, you put all this crap into this bank account, eventually, it's going to pop and it's going to come back at you. So I have a much better life now. My head, I, I, unfortunately, I was abused. But as part of that, they had to give me therapy, part of my settlement. I'm like, oh, I'm going to therapy. Best thing I ever had because I'm happy with myself. I'm mean. You know, I'm, I, I can sleep at night. I don't have fears that I'm, somebody's going to break in and kill me or my dogs are going to get, you know, stolen and run over by a car. All this stuff that was in my brain is because of trauma. And I learned it, 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 there's scientific things where your brain rewires your neurons for safety and you don't think clearly and all that kind of stuff. And I also see other people's pain and mental illnesses. And I give people really wide berths of being themselves. But now I have boundaries. I don't pick up little lost puppy people. And don't worry, I'll make it better. Let me produce your record for $10 and you could rip me off. I have boundaries. So my life is much better now. And I tell these stories in hopes that people will... I don't even care if you buy my records or listen to it because most people stream it anyway. I'm not making money. But if I could do anything, hey, if I did all this shit, you can't. You, you, whatever you're going through right now, and there's people that listen there, they, 
somebody died, to a relationship broke up, their career wasn't going, they hate their job, but the apartment's driving. Just, just, just whatever you want to do. You want to be a drug dealer, be the best drug dealer. You want to be a musician, be the best musician. You don't have to be out there. At, 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 if, if you're not Beyonce and, and and what's his name as billionaires, like I have diabetes, I've got a I've got a, a thing here and a and a, and, a, and, a, and a pump, right? So I said to my doctor, you you can't lose weight taking insulin; it's really hard. And right. I said, I said, you know what? I'm going to be the best fat bastard I can be. I'm going to be the best <laughs> fat bastard that I that you've ever had. And he says, that's what that's how you're going to stay alive. And that's the way I look at it. If I can't change something, then it's there and deal with it. But I'm whatever else I could do in my life, this one thing is not going to take down the whole house of cards over here. I'm going to be the healthiest fat bastard. I'm going to be, uh, yeah, you know, somebody that can tell stories to other people and show them that if you think your life is bad, it's <laughs> much worse out there, you know. But also with that, you see a lot of pain. So I cry it. TV commercials on Hallmark movies. It's disgusting. I go to the movies, I got to sit in the third row because everybody's behind me. Because I'm like, oh my God, look at the room. You got to watch this movie. It's awesome. Because I feel people's pain. You know what I mean? Because I've been through a lot. So I hope my stories, and it's not about getting rich or anything like that. I, I, I hope people could just, you know, realize shit happens and. We all die. We have learned. We all squat to pee is what I used to we say. Learn, we all learn from these stories. The more well, you... I hope so because I could keep them into myself. And, you know, I was I, I was on the pity pot. And why me? And I'm adopted. And then I went to a crazy mother. And then it, I was living with a pedophile who told me the space people were coming. And I lived on my own. And I had to eat peanut butter for five years and didn't have a record. And then I got a record. And then I got ripped off. And then my friends died of AIDS. And I don't know. Brooklyn, what happened? But it's me. That's fantastic. So how do you make it something good? You tell the stories about it. It's therapeutic, obviously, for me. But hopefully, people like Lenny call me and ask me to run my mouth for two sure. hours. What, whatever it is, and hopefully, it could help people. God bless, Van Parish. Marsha Stern sending her love to you. Hey, Marsha. Any S questions in there? Any questions? Well, they're all kind of like um, Black Barbie. Her cousin is Peter Basquit, this the, the her who just passed. Yeah. And she was telling as you because I didn't want to stop you. Uh, let me go back. She Question. said, "Parish, I think you must know my cousin Andre Walker, fashion designer." I yeah I yeah I know yeah. I, yeah he yeah, was the Andy yeah. Warhol's Diaries on Netflix. I'm so proud of my cousin. Yes. Yeah, I, I, the, a lot of the names I didn't know, a lot of the faces I did know. But yes, yes, yes. There's so many, pe so many people back then, you know. So many people didn't tell their stories. They didn't hey, get time to. They didn't I get survived AIDS. I survived drugs. I survived sexual abuse. I'm still here. I got to tell my story. Th there's so many things that happened back there, that music. But there's also stuff that happened in the gay world that people don't know about. There was etiquette to cruising and cruising spots and things that. You wouldn't understand, but gay people would. And I feel like I have to tell these stories to them because a lot of people now are very gay, bi, black, Spanish, uh, underprivileged, overprivileged. I marched in those fucking, I marched in those parades like the second year after Stonewall, not because I was gay, but because people had to have rights, right? So back then you suffered and you died. Now the stuff that we did and we marched for let's two boys or two girls hold hands at Disney. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or whatever it is. So, you know, if these stories just help people realize, yeah, it's bad. You're born, life sucks, then you die. But you can also have a good turn that those lemons into lemonade. You know what I mean? And that's the way I look at it. And, uh, any questions? I have, I have, I have a question though. Did you ever think that your, your records, would be life changing for many people. I still can't deal with that. You understand because that? I, you understand that? Feeling? No, I don't understand that. I struggle with it because, and it's my own neurosis about having an ego and thinking that your music is better than other people's music. People told me that for a long time, and I dismissed it. Like, okay, you like the record, you don't have to go that far. You know what I mean? When I look back at it, a lot of people—not a lot. 
a dozen people did electronic dance records, but in those days, if you had an album out with not one song, but 12 songs, now you're a real artist. So I had a chance that a lot of people didn't because the record company wanted to rip me off more, which in turn helped me because I was a real artist. I had records out, albums out. I wasn't a one hit wonder. Um, and people, I was, you know, like Kraftwerk. We, we were around the same era. And so was Arthur Baker with that stuff. We had programmable drum machines and we weren't trying to make records that were cool. We were just making records because I couldn't do what Erasure and Depeche Mode did. I didn't know how they did it. So we did our broken, funky, ghetto version of that, which turned out to have its own sound and be a style. But we weren't trying to make a style and we're going to be the new jazz musicians of the, you know, or whatever, or, or the new wave movement. We were just doing music because we had a drum machine and we could do this stuff. And we wanted to sound like Kraftwerk. But we didn't sound like Kraftwerk. We had yeah, not like we, you, but just sounded incredible. We were like, holy smoke, this is incredible. This because track. I was trying to emulate Erasure. Uh, right. Uh, but Vince you wanted to be my them. Idol. You know, people yeah, like, you wanted to be them. Yeah. I want that's what I wanted. I wanted those pop synthesizer, you know, sequencer. We didn't have sequencers. After that bass note, I it was, it was, it was, it was no that, MIDI yet, anybody. Hey, listen to me. He had no MIDI yet. No We MIDI. had no MIDI. We had no computers. You had the C V though. You had that C V. No, we didn't. This is before that. Oh, well, C V, yes, yes, yes. We had C V. We had C V. So first you sequencer that up. I got was Georgia Moroda's eight step uh, sequencer. I have it in my storage. Um that you had to enter uh, 12 notes, 12 gates, and 12 triggers. So 12 mm -hmm. 36 keypad entries in hexadecimal oh. for each measure. And then if you went four bars later and you and you did one, like 11, you thought you put 12 because you're going blind. <laughs> it would, it's like two flashing lights. Everything would go out of sync. And you'd have to not edit, but you'd have to erase all that to get back to where the mistake was and build it again. And one night I programmed until like four o'clock in the morning, my eyes are bleeding, used to back it up to a cassette tape. I still had my Radio Shack Tandy computer and it was 16K. I think this was 8K. And you back it up to an audio cassette with a barred modem, right? And it made like a <laughs> sound and it backed up the data. And I said, I'm too tired. I got to go to sleep. Leave it on. You'd be fine. I got up in the morning. I opened the door. I'd worked from like nine in the morning to like four in the morning, at nine a.m. to like four in the morning, programming this one song with like four or five different sequences plugged into my analog. Yeah. Open the door. The dog runs in, trips over the wire, and raise, like erases all of it. And that's what it was like doing analog stuff in those days. People tell me, "Oh, you're so cool. You did analog gear. That sound." I'm like, "Are you out of your friggin' mind? Look at the." Oh, yeah, you get everything look, look, look at that. I press the button. No. My bass sound comes back from two days ago. I can't do that with analog gear. Never. Never. And there were sequences. So the drum machine and the bass line would sync together. Well, what about six simple synthesizers and man-made and all those little clockwork sequences that are going on in the background? Well, roll the tape back. Let's start. I know it's at, you know, I, I know the dial was set here. Don't move the dial. One, two, three, four, punch in. Bar one, bar two, bar three, bar four, by ten, and they're out of sync. Roll it back to bar eight, bar nine, by ten. Punch in again, and I'd hit play on the drum machine, and it it, it, it would synchronize, and then they would start going back. Okay, roll it back again. And this is what we did, track over track over track over track over track, to make it sound like Georgia Moroda did when he... Uh, 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 MC Square... Um, Equal MC Square album. That whole album. Here is, to eternity. Oh. That whole album, if you put the needle down, it plays all the way to the end. You flip the record over, and it plays all the way to the end again. There are no cuts on that record. There are grooves where the record start. Those That was a whole continuous thing that did, did across like 12 MC8 micro composers. And when one finished, the next one picked it up. And it was a continuous mix. That was a technological feat that I don't know why people don't talk about. right? And we, I tried to emulate that. I wanted to have that kind of clockwork, that Kraftwerk precision, but the pop sound of erasure. Right? I wanted Kraftwerk's precision with the songs of erasure, Depeche Mode, and all that kind of stuff. Right? Wow. And you got me. 
<laughs> yeah, now we got you know, the culmination of all that. Is what so when people tell me it's really cool, I'm like, I don't know. I just kind of made a record. I'm thank you. Right, exactly. Thank you, but I was just, I don't know. You don't sit down and I tell you, you don't put a quarter in the in, in the candy machine and up pops a roll of. A, a, oh a, wait a, a minute! Oh, sorry. Back then, you know, let's talk about that real quick. Now with Logic, all those loops and everything are there for you. Those sounds. Which I love. Right. But, but well, then I edit wait. and I use. I have no shame in samples. Wait, wait, wait. I, and go back in time to the when you were doing it, you had to make the sounds. It's funny because I often say, you know, our 808, you wouldn't just plug it in and let it go. You'd put a little, um, you know, 240. That's a meat of the drum. I remember the point of the kick drum. You, there would be a kick drum and then you would push one or two K and there's a little pick on the top of the kick drum so when you have this music that pop would associate your ear with that lower end kick drum and you could follow the metronome you could follow the beat so you know but all that is it's almost like the same sample was sampled so many times nobody's even running an 808 anymore and tuning it and you know compressing it and EQing it it's like a sample of a sample of a sample of a sample is in that is in that sample <laughs> it's crazy but there were I had the first sampler in New York. It was the Emulator One. It weighed about 75 pounds. It uses three and a half inch floppy disks, no MIDI, and it sampled two seconds at the at, at half. It was 22K sampling, so it was half, it was 12, 11K. And what's 11K? A little bit higher than voice range in two seconds. And you could put in A, 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 E, 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 I, O, U, U, U. And, um, I used to rent out my gear or, or loan it out to those studios, you know, and half of my gear was used on all of those records. Herbie so, Hancock okay. borrowed my sampler for uh, it's on good morning America or the channel five thing and sent it back broken and wouldn't pay for it. And I got rid of it. Yeah, you know what I mean? Cause it got damaged and moving it, but yeah. I always had the latest use gear. Use that on rocket that right on the, on the rocket. Right? No, 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 no. He used a fair light on rocket, I believe. Right. But, uh, he tried to, they had Herbie Hancock on, I think it was called Good Day New York and Channel 5, Fox. Okay. And, and he was demonstrating what samples do. And that it, I, I think it's on YouTube and he's playing an emulator one and that's my machine because I was the only one in New York who heard it. And talk about the Fairlight. That was a $100,000 uh, computer that also sampled just a couple of seconds. And it had a screen where you take a light pen and, and, and put points on it to make music. Cost about a hundred thousand dollars. I think maybe you got four seconds if you were lucky, but it's what Order Noise used. Michael Jackson, uh, 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 Frankie mm -hmm. goes to Hollywood uh, with Tre Trevor Horn. So Vanguard Studios would rent us the studio over the weekend for like one hundred and fifty dollars. No, 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 not Vanguard. Uh, we, we'd rent it on Sunday. Uh, the toy, the toy, the toy store, the toy factory, the toy store. I think it was called had all the synth gear part yeah. of. Oh, what's I can't remember the name of the studio. It was a synth studio on 48th Street uh, 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 in Manhattan. Rogue, and I mean, you had Manny's, Rogue Music. Right on that corner upstairs, right on the corner of Broadway, there was a studio. Uh, Unique was over there. Unique. It was Unique. Bobby and they had all the synthesizer gear, and they rented it out. It was somebody like me with tons of synths, but he rented it out. And we used to rent. It was either through him or through SIR. We rented a, a studio instrument rentals. We rented a Fairlight. We rented on Friday, Michael Modesky and I, the Alicia record, Two Turned On and Baby Talk. We'd rent it. We'd do it. You, you rented it on Friday, but they didn't charge you for Saturday and Sunday. So we got a one-day rental on Friday, returned it Monday morning, but had Saturday and Sunday. So we'd rent it on Friday. They delivered them a truck, took two guys to lift it up to the second floor because it weighed 150 pounds in like three cases or something like that. We'd oh. set it up, get to work around noon on Friday. By Sunday, we'd put, put it in the back of my friend's car, drive it to uh, 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 the studio. It was all set up. He would record it. And then around midnight, somebody would come in and sing, like Alicia or whatever. And then we would deliver the thing the next morning back to the studio rental. Um, two sisters and stuff. We'd go in the studio at 8 o'clock at night to 8 o'clock in the morning. They'd give us the, the, the graveyard shift thing. And like, what do we do? I don't know. Let's do a record. Okay, I'm going to have Teresa, this girl I'm sleeping around with. She's going to sing it. Okay. You know, uh, uh, we do a hi, 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 noon, 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 ha, 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 ha. And I'm laying down the tracks and Raul's working on lyrics with Teresa. And then she's singing it. She goes home at midnight or 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. 
And by 5 or 6 a.m., we mix the record and it's ready to go. You know, we were under pressure and we made $50, $100 for those things. So Here, sign here. Here's your $50. We didn't even sign for those things, dude. I reclaimed all that back. Those are my records. You never paid me. You never signed a P. Those are my records. You you want to come? You want to come after me? Let's go to court. Right. <laughs> well, you know that. You oh yeah, because some money. The law and the lay and the law is show us the contract. You have no contract. Show us the contract. Show me the. Oh, if there's a contract, show me the check. There was no contracts. There's no checks. That's my music. I okay. can come after you for putting it out. Technically, cash deals. But I don't do that. I'm I, I'm not vindictive like that. But I, I I license and that's my music. That's all. You don't like it? Take me to court. Let's talk about it. Same thing with Unidis. Good luck on that. I'm curious. Oh, I got, I'm I very got, curious. I got, I got a trademark lawyer. Ahead. They can't find a trademark. It, it shit's coming down the pike, and I hope the news covers it because I, I want to be their karma for screwing up so many people. So oh, many I, people. So many people. There used to be something there. Uh, Canada had its own laws, U.S. had its own laws, and you can go over the border of Canada. And you could rob and sell anything worldwide. And it was next to impossible for an artist in the U.S. to chase after them because you needed Canadian lawyers and all that. And nobody had the money to do that, especially independent artists. So George Cucuzzo and people like that stole stuff. Record companies got out of business and they just claimed it was theirs. And there was nobody to stop them. You know, do you want to funk all those classics? You know what I mean? Um, but then they opened up the Free Trade Act between U.S. and Canada and the laws became common. Beautiful. Beautiful. I'm not. I'm not vindictive. No, uh, but it, what's right is right, and I know that. I, I we all know that. It's after you, know, you get I'm, another f bomb. After you get fucked for so long, you use, you learn to ask for Vaseline. Well, the question really was back then was, how would you like it? Would you like it sand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, because you didn't know, or you knew, and you were desperate and couldn't afford. Uh, you couldn't afford a lawyer. Because lawyers were five or ten thousand dollars. I mean, I went to a lawyer once or twice. All right, that'll be seven thousand dollar retainer. I got fifty dollars in my bank account, and my rent's coming up in two weeks. And yeah, how am I going to pay this? I can't pay. Well, you. I was a male prostitute for six months, and I couldn't take it—not for the sex, but because it was so sad that people just wanted to have company. It was a joke, you know. And I was like, "Oh, great! I'm a teenage guy. I'm going to have sex every day and get paid for it." No, I was like, but "Do we have to have sex?" Oh, my life sucks. I'm like. Oh, this is not what I signed up for. Where's the fun part? And I'm getting paid. I'm a stud. No, you're not. You're a therapist. <laughs> I'm out. I'm out. So <laughs> I never sold drugs. I never did. I did crazy things. But somehow or another, that's how you know when you're on the right path by the universe. And I can get all tree hugger and spiritual and hippie. But if you're on the right path, things work. You may not be on everybody else's path. Right. You may be living homeless, and I was homeless, but somehow or another, I, I ate without money. You know, I had a place to live without paying rent, or I had a record out, you know, and people knew my name, but I wasn't being paid. But I was kind of on the right path. It, it, it was, the train was wobbling, but I was on the right path. So if you're with the grain, it may not be everybody else's. They have a car, they have a house, they have a plane, they have a bank account. You don't. That doesn't mean anything. Be on the right path and you'll get there. And that, right, Lenny, now, now you can go to sleep and I'm 64. I can go have my Geritol and my uh, laxative and go to sleep in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the eccentric. Geritol. You see, the good thing about being crazy and the good thing wait, about wait, wait. being wait, eccentric, wait. the good thing about being crazy and being bad eccentric, it's licensed to kill. You could say anything, you could do anything, and nobody's right. shocked. So Here we go. Ready? That shit crazy. Commercial break, everyone. Prevision. For moments where you don't remember. It's you more like gas. At my age, it's more like gas X. <laughs> God bless this man. We love him. Thanks. Oh, I am so glad. And Manparish.com. I busted my this ass. This is truly a true house story. I met Frankie Knuckles. I played at a, a talk about house. Uh, I met Frankie Knuckles, and for years I wanted to meet him. I played at the Gay and Lesbian Center. They used to, and when I was in the seventies, I would get sick and pneumonia because I wasn't eating and I was run down. And they would give me penicillin for free. And then, you know, in nineties, two thousands, they asked me to DJ for the gay community, and they would give me a check, and I'd hand it right back to them and say, "Please give this to somebody who needs it, who doesn't have food and money." But I gave it back, 
And one night they had me playing on the second floor and the it was it's an old school with a gymnasium. They had a gymnasium on the oh, first I know floor. the place. I know the place. Oh right, yeah. So I played the second floor and Frankie Knuckles played the first floor. Are you, on the, are you coming out? Is, is 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 this Lenny's coming out party? No, hey, happy Pride! Can, yes, not, yes, you are especially for our happy Pride. Enjoy, 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 this is my give back to well, I've been around the gay community forever. Well, you never know. You may be queer too. Oh, anyway, queer so, folk, my friends, queer folk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, I remember I cut the night early. Craig is playing to two o'clock, and as a DJ, you know you can crash your floor when you want to. And at <laughs> yeah. so at once, and I didn't do these glamorous 45 minutes. Well, why don't you come and play? Like, how long are you playing? You could play for an hour. An hour? I do eight hour, 10 hour sets. Old school. I can't play in an hour. I'm just warming up. You know what I mean? But um, around one o'clock, about 1.30, I crashed the floor. Jet, small, nice landing. And they're packing stuff up. I said, Billy, pack my stuff. I, I got to go downstairs. And I'm standing next to Frankie, like, oh, Frankie Knuckles. And he goes, hi, 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 hi. And he looks at me and literally like, like, what do you want? Why are you back here? And I said, my man Parrish. And you're what? You're a legend. I said, no, you're a legend. You're, you're my hero. No, you're my right, hero. Right, exactly. That's what happened. It was, like, it was funny. It was like, a yeah. He goes, you could understand. I did records listening to your records. I said, that's, that's weird right. because I learned house music by listening to your records. And that's, I house right. music. that's exactly right. Because that's what we did. We all did that, man. You know what I mean? Todd Terry, the same thing with Todd Terry. You know we all I mean? did that. I said the same thing to you. Yo, dude, we studied your records like you have and no I idea. Their rec- I got to study Lenny records now. You know what I mean? It's, it's, that's the way it is. Oh, and that stuff, you know, it's weird. And DJing them and seeing the reaction and the people going crazy. And then you say to yourself, I want to make a record just like this. Well, I had my own party. I didn't DJ. A lot of DJs become musicians and release records. I was a record producer and I had my own party for 15 years. Like I said, at the cock, longest running party ever in New York City. Continuous. We never shut down for 15 years. I went in snowstorms where the snow was up to my chest on the side, dragging my DJ bag and the place would be full. The, the legal capacity was 87. We had 400, 420 people every week. The floor would bend. You know, If you go to my website and you look under art and click on sperm, uh, there's the sperm party and the sperm installation. It'll show you what we did at that bar. We had camouflage in it. We'd push the furniture around. We would make room dividers. We had, I, had la- I bought lasers every couple of weeks and, 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 and computer controlled lighting. I mean, it was, it, it, I mean, what we did was insane. Um, but the DJ that I hired played music for himself. He put on headphones and, and he'd smoke some weed and get into his own trip. And people were standing there like this. And I said, what? I, what's going, why is that? And then I realized as a DJ, you have to be an entertainer. So, can you play Madonna? You know, that's the joke. Of my no, you don't have to do that, but you no, have no, no. to. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Watch, I, you have to play. You have to see what's in front of you. No, 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 no. I can play Madonna, but I've spent all week finding the craziest, most the coolest, coolest, coolest track. remix version of Madonna yeah, yeah, that yeah. I could work into my set. I've shut you up, and I've blown people's mind. <gasps> He's playing Madonna. What, what is this? Madonna? What is oh, my it? God. This is so cool. So, that's the version that Shep did, the dub mixes that nobody heard, right? That's right. another one. Shep Pettibone, we did some work with him. He goes, I listen to your stuff. I, I listen See? to your stuff. I keep saying it over and over. We're at the same crew of people, because here we go. You're with John Robbie, Arthur Baker. John Roby. John, excuse me. John Roby, Arthur Baker. You know, they had a huge fight. They don't talk to each other over royalties and all that kind of stuff. No, it's it's no. a shame, because they were a great team. I think yeah. John sued Arthur. And I don't think John did very well after it. I, I, I think he mentally, he just, a lot. Of, where are they now? What happened? A lot of people in this business lost it because you're promised success. You're promised people are going to love you. You're going to have a hit record. You've given up real life and you've lived, eat, drank, and slept music. You get your chance to do it. You get ripped off. You don't get paid. And you're a deer in the headlights. What just happened? And it's got to be my fault because everybody else has records out. What did I do wrong? And a lot of people, like John, I think, wasn't able to handle it. Arthur Russell, may he rest in peace. You know what I'm saying? Like you're from the same. Ligon and Barbosa. Yeah. 
Miss Barbosa, yes. You're from that crew that changed music drastically. We we were the first, uh, Arthur and I were the first people to do it. You know, we I were know. Lucky. We were in there from the beginning, you know. And because I was the first people to do it, a lot of those people turned to me or to Arthur to create that sound. I didn't know I was creating a sound. It's just how I made it. Give me my, all right, for you super geeks, hip hop bebop, an 808 drum machine, a Prophet 1 synthesizer for the bass, and a Prophet 5 for everything else, including those doom, 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 Prophet toms. Those were programmed on a Prophet 5 synthesizer. And that little da 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 was an OB8 Oberheim um, SEM module. It was just a little voltage controlled module. That's all that was on that. Later the, on, the, Boogie the, Down Bronx, I had the Emulator wait, wait. 1 to a sample. Yeah, for, man, what was the. That was the. That, that was the Oberheim's uh, SEM, the Oberheim mod. If you if you Google SEM, Oberheim SEM module, you'll see it. Oh. And I just charged for $55,000, eight of them. <laughs> I bought my 808 for four five hundred dollars, sold it for a thousand, and went to buy it back, and it was something like four, three or four grand or something. Yeah, forget yeah. it. Forget yeah, it. I mean, I've got the samples, and do I have, I have my 808 here somewhere? I just signed somebody's the other day. They wanted me to sign their 808. And they had Arthur Baker and a bunch of other people. I have the old. I have the the the, the Roland, not you know the the new one, the green the nine. But I got. That's the other thing I'm going to offer. I have the largest sample collection of drum machines, the Alessis, the Lindrum, the Obscura, the, you know, TR-808, 303-909-606-727. I have Lindrums and a, a, a Kawhi machines and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to offer those for sale on my website. If I can't make money selling music, I can, I can sell some stupid samples. Or whatever. But look, I'm not into making money. I sold my parents' house. I bought some real estate. I have tenants. I can pay my bills. It's about my legacy right now. I just put up music that I like to do. Some of it's dance music. Some of it is like... Oh, spill. oh, wait, wait. Did your parents ever realize the effect of that $2,500 investment they made in you and what happened? No way, right? I remember the hip-hop... Uh, my, 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 I think my mother was gone. And um, Carlos de Jesus from KTU had hot tracks on... ABC. Yes. The video show. So my video, the record company wouldn't pay for me to do a video. So we had a, a Mel Aldegary, who's a great film, 60 millimeter film. And she said it would be about $900 to process the film. That's the cheapest I could do it. So we did my hip hop bebop video, which is on my website in 1983. Record said, we're not going to do music videos. That's a waste of time. You're wasting your money. <clears throat> like David Bowie's manager said to me, you're going to do synthesizers? Oh, that's such a fad. It's all rock and roll, dude. You're wasting your time. And I did a rock and roll record, delivered it to Electro Records, and they flipped out and, you know, you're off the label. Well, of course, you hired me for hip-hop, bebop, what I wanted to do. And there's a there's a video of me in the truck at, at, at 22 or 23 years old under the rare section of my videos. And I look like this little cherub making music. And it was a crazy song that a lot of people love now, and I wish I had the master I'd release it. Um... But uh, um, um, when we did the video, it, it was on Hot Tracks. And it has a lot of, we couldn't pay for special effects. So she inverted the colors. So, you know, black became white, red became green for a couple of frames that it flips. And my father fell and broke his hip. He's lying in the hospital watching it on TV and calls the TV station, swear to God, and says, stop screwing with my son's video because it's like doing black and white and all these things. And he's trying to sing. and you know, he's no good. You know what I mean? And people are going to think he's no good. So up until the end, my father said, you never got a job at the post office. You don't have a pension. So I never made money from my music. I know it sounds hard and you're stupid. Why did you stop doing music? I stopped for a while, but I, I, I got to do it. I'm sorry. I got to do music. It's in me. It's just dripping out of me. You know, I, I go to places where there's machinery and I hear patterns and you know, uh, uh, an air piston and a, and a truck makes music to me. It sounds great. Crickets chirping. I'm like, no, that's beautiful. Can I use that in a song? So I'm very sound centric, very sound oriented. I can't read or write music, but I could put sounds together. And I call myself that's Man Parish good. artist, not to be a snob, no, but a, I can't be Man Parish musician yes. because I don't write music. So 
That's a gift, brother. Well, I'm, I'm in MoMA. I mean, the... the, 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 the you hear that, people? He's in the Modern Museum. The a prestigious museum of modern art. They did a... There was a place called Club 57 in New York on 57th Street between A and B. And it was kind of like the uh, cafe society. And I went there a lot. Not to be a snob, but a lot of the clubs were too busy on the weekends. And Keith Haring, if you know who he is, the artist used to hang out there. John Chabasquiat, the artist, used to hang out there. Uh, uh, um, all these like local art people. Yeah, all the talent. Yeah, all the hot we, we understood each other. So MoMA did a thing on that that all these famous people now, whatever it is, hung out there and they did a thing on that. So they took, uh, um, I do paintings and drawings and stuff like that, but it wasn't for that. Uh, they put my hip hop bebop video in the thing at MoMA on 53rd Street, the big museum, which is a big deal. And he, uh, they call said, Why don't you come down on Thursday? You, you know, we're previewing it and, you know, make sure you like it. I'm like, I don't, you know, I, I'm not going to tell you I don't like it. And, you, know, you know what you're doing. You know, my stuff's in the show. Yay. I was with Billy, my other half. I've been, been there 20 years and, you know, we got married a two, few years ago and I got a social security check finally. I'm that old. But um, Billy and I went down and the curator. Can you believe down. that too? Wait, wait, man. You know, it's hard to believe we're all getting older. It's hard to come on. As the kids say, I'm old AF. You know what I mean? No, I'm no, old. no, but that's but come no, on. Let's be you know, real. The old dude. We're not letting it stop us. We're still. You, you know, it's funny when they say, and the legend man perish, and I always make a joke. That's what they call you when you're in the wheelchair, I right? They can't. wheel you out like George Burns. Or. You know what I mean? like, what's his name from the doors? Yeah, what? yeah, whatever. You know, they wheel you out. Yeah, ex or, or, or what's his name from uh, uh, um, 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 not the doors, you know, uh, the drummer uh, uh, in the air tonight. Uh, 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 Phil Collins, they wheel you out in the wheelchair and you're a legend. You know, so I have a wheelchair. <laughs> well, my dad used to come here so they could wheel me around in it, you know. Uh, but um, I just lost track. What was I, what was I yakking about? I can't we were remember. talking about all the museum stuff. And oh, 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 so we, we, we're standing there, and they have this big thing, and they're showing Hip Hop Bebop, and they're showing uh, John Michel Basquiat, they're showing Keith Haring, and all these things. I'm like, wow, this is really cool. They think I'm important. Okay. And the curator from the museum comes out and goes, Mr. Parrish, I'm, I'm, I'm the curator of MoMA. The curator is the director and the guy who decides what gets to be put at MoMA. And I'm like, Billy, stand up straight. You know, I mean, like, yes, yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Director. And he, he had a bag and he pulls out and he goes, Can I have an autograph on my man, Parrish, or the collar? And I went, I said to him, I said, that, that nightmare. And, 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 and an art nightmare. And I said, What? He goes, Are you kidding me? I grew up listening to your music. I used to break dance on vinyl. And I said that he goes, I'm going to tell you something. He says, I had to fight. I got three of your pieces of music, your music. This is a visual art museum. And I can't put music in the archives, but we put a music video to hip hop, bebop in our permanent collection. And I had, I did two student film soundtracks. One's called Beehive. It's on my website in the video section. Uh, and, and another one called The Joneses, which is not there. I don't even know if there's a copy of it anymore. And that's in the permanent collection. In, in, in the film department, I was like, wow. And I said, I wish I did a sound installation. He goes, you want to do a sound installation? I'm like, at Mama? Yeah. That's so cool. I, did a, I did a sound installation, which is kind of like a drone, but not quite. And he said, what's it about? And I, I said, well, does art have to be a painting on the wall? Can sound be art? So what's the definition of art in a museum? If I put sound in a museum, is that art? Or does art only have to be that painting, you know, on the wall? That's that's what art is. And they love the concept. And I did a sound installation. It's an hour-long drone. If you go to manpower.com and you look on the music and you click uh, under art, you click on MoMA. People want to, wait, wait, hang on a second. They want to know if I'm live. Christopher X. Is hey, that Chris. What's up? Tell me, manpower. People are asking. Yeah, here's one question. Let's get one. Yeah, I know. This is pre-recorded. I died years ago, and this is a hologram. <laughs> what? Look. Man Parrish died in 1984. <laughs> I, can, I, I can pass my hand. What's that thing where they do? You know, you do yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My hands come up. One of the last and final questions. Who was the best and worst to work with for you? Oh, I love these when I hear it from other people. Um, 
I remember when we did I Am What I Am with Gloria Gaynor. She's known to be a little tough. Um, she came into the studio. We busted our ass and I'm going to meet Gloria Gaynor. And she came into the studio and goes, who's he? You know, and that's the guy that synthesized Get out. I'm going to sing. And they're like, okay. And when I walked out, she had lime green uh, stretch pants on. No, she had a lime green top, lime green stretch pants with the biggest camel toe I've ever seen in my life. And I thought, bitch, I'm going to tell that story one day. <laughs> and that's the God's honest truth. <laughs> um, there's a story about Boy George. My friend died in his apartment. That was a big nightmare. That changed my life and other people's lives around us. Um, the best, uh, Cindy Lapa was a little off the walls. Uh, Michael worked for James Brown. I was supposed to go to that session. I got sick. And he said, uh, hi, James. I'm here to call. You don't call me James. You call me Mr. Brown. Oh, okay. Mr. Brown. You know what I mean? Uh, he, he was a toughie. He used to find people like like $25 or $50 if they did a wrong note. It, it, you know, the horn players and all that kind of stuff. All these stuff, yeah. crazy stories. Good ones were, um, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, a lot of stuff like Roberta Flack, I got the stuff and I didn't work with them in person. Who was a real sweetheart? I'm, uh, uh, they're all monsters. <laughs> I can't think of the good ones, but I remember the bad ones. <laughs> it's the cup half empty. <laughs> that's the for me, is okay. So for me, the most best record you felt you worked on, your best. The best you... record that I worked on? It's actually stuff now. Um, my even, last... if it's now, even if it's now. That's because, fine. because I knew people say it, but I'm growing. So I'm happy with what I'm doing. Uh, sales wise, hip hop, bebop, boogie down Bronx, a uh, male. No, no, I'm talking about sales wise. No, no, I'm just saying sales wise. It's those because right. they're in the multi millions. You know what I mean? But remember, happiness, we had a five platinum record with hip hop, five million copies, five times platinum. Five eighty five. I'm sorry. In the end, it was eighty five million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of uh, um um. Grand Theft Auto was a. Well, I, I don't really. I'm talking about the time when the record. Oh, came. oh, oh, that stuh uh, 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 Five, probably now it's seven or eight. All right, so think about how many lives that record changed. How many babies were born from that record and all that. What are people having sex to hip hop, bebop? It's not a group. It's not like you're putting on a Barry White record and you want. No, to but you know what? You're playing records. If you're playing a night out. I was listening to records, you know, you never know. And you got drunk and you got laid. Okay. And that works. You never know. You never know. Yeah, but you so I'm responsible for a oh, boom, they, oh. for baby boomers because of hip hop people. And, and track suits and Adidas shell tops. And it go no, with my felines and my Kango hat, yo. And you gotta All that and, comes and you gotta from. understand when I played clubs like that, I showed up looking like Freddie Mercury. With construction shoes, got a, 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 a five hundred one jeans and a tank top T shirt because that and a mustache, a porn mustache because that was cool in the gay world. And Freddie Mercury tried to pick me up one day at a gay bar, and I didn't know it was Freddie Mercury. And I tell that story, I'll tell it really quickly. There was a gay bar in New York where Freddie Mercury used to go to, and down the block there was another bar, and it was too crowded. I said, "Let me go over to this first bar because they have a better sound system." I had my records up, but. Those guys weren't listening to hip hop, bebop, so they didn't know man Paris was. So I could just hang out and see what's what new mix was out and all that kind of stuff. And this guy with buck teeth starts staring at me, and I knew Freddie Mercury, but I didn't know Freddie Mercury had buck teeth because I didn't listen to Queen. And I said, "Oh God, you know, you ugly Freddie Mercury lookalike with buck teeth." <laughs> I didn't ever say that, and, and, and he's getting close. Yeah, loud. Well, Man, said, did, you out loud like that? did you say that out loud? Out loud. No. Oh. So I said, please don't be one of these like satellite people that, you know, you know, it, just like girls experience, gay guys experience the same thing. You know, there's somebody trying to, to here it comes, here comes the, hey, you new in town? You know, <laughs> here come the line, you know. And I kept moving away and he kept coming close and people are looking at me and I'm going, what? You know what I mean? Not because I'm Man Paris and he's Freddie Mercury. It's just like, I don't know. They're looking at this guy who's trying to check me down. It's like, hey, hey, look what's going on over here. And I'm moving. He's moving. And I'm trying to get away. And it's crowded. And I wound up in a corner. And I'm looking the other way. I turn around. He's right here. And he's like, hey, what's your name? You know, like, and I said, I think I said my name was Tony. Oh, I'm Fred. 
or Freddie or something like that. And I said, okay, cool. And then, you know, if a girl give you attitude, same thing. I'm like, you know, looking at my shoes and uh, nice weather we're having, whatever the conversation was. <laughs> and uh, I, you could tell I was like, nice. can I give you my number? And I was like, yeah, okay. He walks away and like the place is looking at me and I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, like, what? So he gives me the number and I said, okay, I got to go. got to meet my friends. I walk out. It was the short blocks, not the long blocks. And I take the number and I throw it underneath the car and I go back into the other bar. And I'm talking to my friend and seconds later, this queen comes up. Oh my God, some queen's over at the other bar giving Freddie Mercury attitude. And I'm like, what do you mean Freddie Mercury? He goes, Freddie Mercury's over there and tried to pick this guy up and everybody's talking about how he gave him shade. And I'm like, that's oh, me, you idiot. <laughs> I said, that was me. Because what do you mean it's me? He, said, I, he, he gave me his number. What do you mean he gave me his number? I said, oh, I threw it out, you know, up the block. My two friends ran out and they're on their stomachs underneath the car trying to find Freddie Mercury's number. And that, my friends, is a true house story. I met Vanessa Del Rio for all you straight guys watching porn back in the day. She wanted me to do music. From the porn soundtrack I did, she wanted me to do music for her uh, Ace Avenue Show World strip show because she liked the music I did in Heatstroke and 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 another Bad Girls Dormitory or something. No, she wasn't in that. She was in Heatstroke. Uh, she was in some movie that I did the music for. And and I had I tortured my straight friends. I said I got Vanessa Del Rio's telephone personal number, and some guy offered me like three hundred dollars for it, and I never called her because I was afraid that. She's going to try to blow me or something like that. <laughs> you know, I didn't know, you know, this, this porn, these crazy porn people will tie you down and force you to have sex with them if you call them. You know, I didn't know. I was a kid. I didn't know these things. You know, If you go to a gay bar, they're going to tie you down to a pool table and they're all going to butt fuck you. You know what I mean? Like, but a gay bar. but it, I will say this. It is overwhelming when you walk into one and you've never been to one. I went to. That anvil, I went to the mine shaft. They opened up Friday at midnight and closed Monday at noon. And they served liquor illegally throughout the whole thing. The top, it was two stories. The top was one, you know, like a 300 square foot bar. And everything on the top floor and the other thousand square feet down floor was a giant back room sex club. I remember going to, see, it was much different back then. We'd go to sex parties where you have clothes checked, not coat checked. And you walk around naked with 300 other guys. I tell people, it's like a hen house. You know, if you have 300 horny gay guys in a room with no clothes on, who's going to say, hey, come on, guys, they're pushing the limit over here. I mean, guys are whores. You know what I mean? It's like, so I saw all of bathhouses, sex clubs. I'm doing an art installation right now for a Pride event. And if you go to NYC, at pridenyc.com, I'm doing a glory hole installation where you actually listen into a glory hole and you hear stories. And above it is a New York city subway map of where all the good glory holes were in Manhattan. <laughs> it's my way of having fun with the art world. You know what I mean? So we did a sperm installation during art week in May and it was the biggest thing for uh, art week. And you could see that I, I took over the base. They said, where do you want to, you want this corner? I said, no, I want the whole entire basement. And I made like these mazes that you go through that opens up into this black light room and, you know, all kinds of four letter words, you know, all over it. And people were dancing, videos were projected onto the floor and um, somebody showed up, took their clothes off and walked around as, as, as performance art. And I'm like, Junior, you want to be on camera? I have a tiny little rescue chihuahua that lived with a drug addict and he had cancer and a broken back and all is 13 years old and lived in a car. It was horrible. Anyway, he's, it must be five o'clock because he's coming out for food. It's, five, oh it's getting close to five o'clock, but I want to I want to thank you, Man Parish. You are true. You know, I'm Lenny, gonna, pull I, the club now. Record now before another story pops up. I'm gonna pull it now. Next Wednesday, Harry Romero is on True House Stories, but it's not gonna be as good as mine. <laughs> it's gonna be way different. Thank you part. guys. Manparish.com. Yes, Harry Parish artist on Facebook and, um, and, and Instagram. And, and, and on 